We see a boy called Percival running in an open field when he spots a rocky bird in the air. It's a pretty rare sight to see one flying around here, so he calls down to his grandpa who clearly has never skipped arm day to help him catch the bird for dinner. With nothing else at hand, the old man finds a pitchfork and chucks it several stories into the air, effortlessly striking down the bird. As the bird falls off a cliff, Percival isn't about to let that meat slip out of his grasp so easily, so he leaps off the cliff and grabs the bird before catching himself on a rock just in time to avoid falling to his death. They then head back inside, where Grandpa leaves the preparation of the bird up to Percival, and he does it all with one hand. After that, they sit down to eat the well-done meat, but in the background, we see some ominous purple magic on the bird which I'm pretty sure is a not good sign. Once done eating, they then head outside for a light sparing match of which, unsurprisingly, Grandpa is the victor after a brief struggle, but Percival takes some pride in knowing that he put up a good fight against him this time. Grandpa goes to wash the dishes while Percival is still celebrating, but then he suddenly remembers something very important. It's Percival's birthday soon and he forgot all about it. He drops everything he was doing and runs back up to the house to find Percival, who is currently taking the leak. He tells him that it's going to be his birthday tomorrow, but he doesn't seem all that interested in it and had even forgotten how old he was before this conversation. He'll be turning 16 tomorrow, which means he will be an adult in this world. He's excited because he thinks that means he will finally be allowed to drink some beer. But while he is old enough to do taxes and join the army, he is still too young for alcohol. Grandpa leads him to the top of the cliff and shows him the vast expanse of space that extends beyond this island just waiting to be adventured, places to see, things to do, and he may even find the One Piece. However, Percival doesn't really care about any of that and just wishes to continue his daily routine here with Grandpa on this island. That night, as they eat their dinner, Grandpa talks about how Percival's father went out on adventures as soon as he turned 16, but as far as Percival knows, his dad is dead. Still, Grandpa asks if Percival really isn't lonely after all the time he has spent on this remote island, but he is perfectly content because he has Grandpa there with him. Later that night, he can't sleep and wanders outside to look at the stars. He thinks about all the wondrous things that his Grandpa had told him about and he is so full of excitement that he can't sit still at all. However, he is still happy with his current life because he has his Grandpa with him, so he doesn't want to change that. That right there is a death flag if I've ever seen one. Percival falls asleep and wakes up to find this knight pulling up to the island in his floating boat. The knight was talking about how his rock bird familiar got shot down earlier, so the person he is looking for must be here. And that is when Percival comes up to him and expresses his amazement to see a knight in a flying boat. The knight says he is searching for someone by the name of Varghese and Percival. With no sense of stranger danger, tells him that that's the name of his grandpa, also asking how he knows him. The knight says that he knew Varghi's 16 years ago, he was still a holy knight, so he is here for a visit. Percival doesn't question anything he said, why a friend would come for a visit in full battle gear or why grandpa would not mention such a close friend in conversations, so he tells the knight that grandpa is currently on the other side of the hill making breakfast. So having gotten the information he needed, the knight goes over there to confront Varghi's, while he tells Percival that he can play with this flying boat to keep him busy. Percival is elated at first and is having a blast in the boat, but then he slowly realizes that everything that just happened was mad saws, and he basically just told a stranger in a suit of armor and a sword where his grandfather is. It finally dawns on him that he may have just screwed up big time and he runs over to go help his grandpa. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, Varghis was busy cutting up some carrots for breakfast when the knight walks up behind him and points out that he is using the sword that he had used as a holy knight to cut up vegetables now. Varghese recognizes the voice and knows that the knight is not one to spend the first five minutes of a fight talking, so he immediately uses his sword to block the incoming strike, but gets blown back into his house. He remains largely unharmed, so he jumps out and leaps forward to counterattack the knight. Their swords clash, but Varghese is unable to break through the knight's defense, and once an opening is created, the knight uses his power to have Varghese looking like the new Twitter logo and destroy his house for bonus points. Percival had arrived a little too late and just witnessed his grandpa getting carved out, so he yells for the knight to stop. The knight obviously isn't going to stop just because he was asked to and fires a shot at Percival, telling him that he is next in line to die at his hands. Percival grabs one of the rocks that was launched by the blast and throws it at the knight before jumping down. The rock didn't manage to do any damage so Percival tries using a bigger rock this time, but it still does nothing and Percival is now in the direct line of fire for one of those shots. Grandpa comes up behind him and prevents the knight from shooting Percival. He then yells for him to run away while he still has the chance, but Percival doesn't want to leave his beloved grandpa to die here. However, the knight has no intention of letting either of them leave here alive, so as he says this, he cuts Varghese open several more times in an instant, 
and then hits Percival with a blast that I can only describe as overkill. Percival is about to fall back, but with the last of his strength, he tries to punch the knight. However, his little arms aren't going to do much damage, and he coughs up some blood before getting punted backwards and falling in defeat and looks up at the sky as it starts snowing. Varghese asks the knight why he would come here to kill him now of all times, and he explains that there was a prophecy foretold a few days ago, where four knights of the apocalypse would bring about the downfall of the Lord King Arthur. They have no real clues on who the knights of the apocalypse might be, so he thought he might as well come here and kill Varghese, you know, just in case. Even if that was his reasoning, he didn't have to kill Percival like that, but he says it was all for the greater good as he leaves. Percival gets up and apologizes to his grandpa for being too weak to protect him, but I'm more curious about how his body is still in one piece after that blast that went in, out, and through a mountain behind him. His grandpa tells him that he shouldn't need to protect someone like him and should find someone more deserving. Percival believes that this must be divine punishment for him lying about being satisfied with staying on the island forever and not wanting to go on adventures so to calm him down, Varghis also admits that he was actually really happy when Percival said he was perfectly satisfied with just staying with him here. This gets Percival to smile a bit, but Varghis soon coughs up more blood, reminding him that he doesn't have much time left to live. He has something he wants to say before he passes on. So he tells Percival that the knight's name is Ironside, and he is actually Percival's father. This shocks Percival because for one, Varghis had told him that his father died when he was younger, and two, what kind of father would slice his own son into four pieces, just in case. This backstory is too long for Grandpa to start explaining right now, so he tells Percival to go and find Ironside if he wants to know the full story. He's sorry, but Percival is going to have to start his new journey alone for the first time. It's going to be tough on him, but Varviz knows he can handle it because he raised Percival to be really tough. The next day, Percival wakes up and looks over at his dead Grandpa, filling him with deep sadness. He buries his body and is left feeling empty inside because his whole world just came crashing down before him. He starts fixing some of the damage done to the house and finds a box underneath a table. In it is a set of new clothes that Varghese had spent several nights sewing for Percival to be able to use on his adventures. A few days pass as Percival has created a monument to his grandpa and is about to leave on his journey. He puts on the helmet and flicks back his cape before tripping on that same cape. Percival begins climbing down the island, but even after an entire day of climbing, he has still made almost no progress at all and can't even see past the clouds. After a little more climbing, he's finally able to see the ground, but in his excitement, he lets go of the cliff and falls to the ground where he finds this creature. He looks up at the creature and thinks about how he has never seen anything like it back on the island. He also introduces himself to it and tells it that he just climbed down from that tall island behind him and is currently looking for a place where other people like can live. However, it doesn't seem to understand a word he just said and begins to walk away from him. Percival keeps following it, so it starts running away from him, eventually leading him to a performing street group. The leader of the group, Cats, throws paper in the air and has them catch on fire while Elva does a trick with a disappearing monkey and a hoop. Cats now wants the last guy to do his trick, but he isn't interested in practicing because there is no one around to see him. However, Percival was watching and was thoroughly amazed by their amazing routine. The others are confused as to where a kid like Percival could have come from because they are currently in the middle of nowhere, but Percival wants them to do some more magic tricks, so Donnie tries to take advantage of the situation and get Percival to pay them for it. However, having lived his entire life on a single island, Percival has no idea what paying even means. Donnie then says he will take Percival's stuff as payment for doing his trick, so he does the trick and makes Percival float to his utter joy and amazement. But while Percival was busy enjoying himself, Donnie had already put the others in the cart and began running away with Percival's stuff. The others tell him that what he just did was pretty messed up and shouldn't leave a kid like that alone in the forest after taking his stuff. Donnie realizes that that kind of behavior puts him firmly in the jackass territory, so he's about to turn around, but then Percival shoots past him with great speed after sprinting to catch up to them. Donnie apologizes because he realized what he did was wrong, but also because he fears for his life after Percival's great feat of strength. Percival tells them he is looking for someone and asks how he can find that person. He tells them the name of the person he is looking for is Ironside, but they don't know who that could be. They ask why he is looking for this person. So Percival explains that Ironside is his father and also killed his grandpa, so they think he is on a quest for revenge. Percival doesn't know whether he wants revenge or not. That is why he wants to go to Ironside and ask him directly why he killed grandpa and why he only showed up now. There are many questions he wants to have answered, but for now, he just wants to beat him up really bad. The group doesn't recognize the name, but they are heading to a village soon, so he might be able to find some information there if he goes with them. 
Percival is delighted, however. Dunny says they aren't going to take him for free, however. This time, he just asks Percival to do a trick so he can go with them. They give him a bow and an arrow to see how well he can aim with it, but he somehow manages to nearly hit Dunny, who is standing behind him. They still take Percival anyway since they are a performing troupe and are going to the village anyway for their next performance. Percival asks if the tricks he saw them do before were their performance and tells them that it was amazing and looked just like magic. However, Donnie doesn't like having to do petty magic tricks just to make a living. Katz explains that they are a group of people who have had their dreams of becoming Holy Knights crushed. At the mention of Holy Knights, Percival remembers Ironside mentioning that both he and Percival's grandpa were Holy Knights previously. The others are surprised to hear this because that means he is the son of the Holy Knight. They ask what country Ironside is meant to be from, but Percival has no idea what a country is, so he isn't able to answer. Just then, two people from the village come running up to them and begging for help. Their village is being attacked by a wolf, so they ask Donnie to use his horse to go and call some holy knights. But since he thinks it is just a regular wolf, he believes they should be more than enough to get rid of it by themselves, and in exchange, he will have the villagers give them food and a place to stay for the night. However, upon arrival, he realizes that the wolf is too much for them to handle and hightails it out of there to go call the holy knights. As they are fleeing, Percival jumps out of the cart to deal with the wolf, since there are still people in danger here. Dunny thinks it's suicide to go in and fight that thing alone when he is just a kid, but Percival doesn't want to let anyone suffer, so he will make sure to be able to protect them. He takes his stance and yells that he is going to kill and eat the wolf, so he takes out his arrows and fires two shots at it. However, he has got his accuracy stat at negative 100, so his arrows fly back towards him and strike him in the head and pin his cape to the ground. The wolf is about to take the chance to strike Percival, but Dunny steps in to save him. He gets knocked back and hurt, so Percival gets angry and decides to give up on the bow and just use what he's good with his hands. After blocking the wolf's second strike, he jumps up and slaps the instincts and consciousness out of it, leaving everyone amazed and the wolf on the ground. As everyone begins to celebrate that they are safe, we see one of those familiar crests on the wolf, and that creature that met him initially is watching from a nearby cliff. Through a magic crystal, a knight is surprised that Percival was able to defeat one of his familiars, so he will be going in personally next to face him. Back in the village, the villagers are talking about how strange it is for a monster of that size to appear in a village. And even worse, there have been reports of similar things happening in the neighboring villages, so they are pretty worried. Donny is being patched up by cats after the wounds he sustained from protecting Percival, and he asks where Percival went off to, being told that he was taken by Elva to the lake to wash up a bit. In the lake, we see Elva shocked by the scar that Percival has on his chest, and even more shocked when the scar runs all the way through to his back, once again bringing up the question, how the hell did he survive that by just sleeping it off? Elva tells Percival that he acts pretty mature for his age despite such a terrible wound because she still believes that he is a kid, but Percival was too busy looking at her and wondering why something was rising. A short while later, Percival is soaking in the lake and thinking about how Donnie is actually a pretty nice guy since he jumped in to protect him after only knowing him for a few minutes. While resting his head on the legendary cushions, Elva tells him that Donnie probably did it because seeing Percival jump in to save the people got him all fired up. Doing something like that makes it seem like he hasn't given up on becoming a holy knight yet. Percival asks what a holy knight is, so she explains that they are people who use their power to oppose evil and uphold justice with their great magic power. He then asks what magic is, and if it has anything to do with the tricks they were doing earlier. She tells him that it is pretty much the same thing, but that their power is far too weak to be considered enough to become a holy knight. They get back to the rest of the people in the village, and they all want to celebrate with their hero. So they all toast to Percival, and he finds the drink to be really delicious. He asks when it is, and is told that is berry juice. Dunny says he would have liked some alcohol, but Elva points out that he is only 16 years old, just like her. Percival hears this and tells them that he is also 16, causing Elva to flush with embarrassment after all she did with Percival in the lake. Anyway, they carry on with the celebration and party a bit, then Percival begins to ask around if anyone has heard of Ironside, but no one seems to know anything about him which begins to frustrate him a lot. He yells at the top of his lungs for Ironside to show himself, but Elva tells him that there is no point in yelling because he isn't here to hear him. However, someone else hears Percival screaming for Ironside and says he knows that name. It is the Black Knight. He comes down from his floating shield and talks about how he only came here to find the kid that killed his familiar, but instead finds that Percival, who was reported to have been killed, is still very much alive. He asks if Varghese managed to survive as well, but unfortunately, Varghese didn't have the levels of plot armor that Percival has and died from his wounds. 
Katz recognizes that this guy is a holy knight and tries to get him to leave Percival alone, but I mean it's a holy knight so Katz gets backhanded away. The holy knight kind of apologizes for hitting Katz so hard since he only wanted to push him away a little and didn't mean to give him a concussion from it. Percival asks the knight why he knows his grandpa and Ironside. Percival asks the knight why he knows his grandpa and Ironside, so he explains that he is Pelagard, someone who knew both his father and grandfather. If he knows Iron Scythe, then Percival tells him that he has until the count of five to tell him where he is and Pelagard is busy talking about how much he likes Percival for not being scared to face a holy knight. They aren't getting anywhere by talking, so Percival and Pelagard prepare to fight. The crowd is smart and runs away so they don't get caught up in what is definitely going to be a chaotic battle. Percival charges forward and surprises Pelagard because he is coming to him without a weapon. But as Percival lands a kick on him and manages to push him back along with his heavy armor, he is thoroughly impressed by the boy's potential. Percival says that if he wins, then Pelagard will have to tell him where Ironside is, to which he agrees, but as he knocks Percival down, he makes his own conditions where if he wins, then Percival must go with him and train under him to maximize his potential. He then strikes Percival with his mace, but he is able to block the blow and leap forward to strike Pell once more. He then unleashes a flurry of attacks on Pell but gets his head palmed. Pell praises Percival for having the courage to leap into danger to protect the weak and the will to not falter, but he tells him to take the fight seriously and at least use magic if he isn't going to be using a weapon. But Percival says he doesn't have any magic to use, which shocks Pell, but gives him all the more reason to want to train Percival. He starts punching him to get him to admit defeat and come with him to be trained, but Percival still refuses to give up. He's getting punched repeatedly while all the villagers watch knowing that there is nothing that they can do to stop it, until one boy screams out for Percival to keep fighting and gives him the motivation to unlock his magic power. The knight feels like he was tricked because Percival had told him that he had no magic, but right now, that definitely looks like magic. However, Percival is just as confused as Pell and begins to freak out after he notices the glowing light emanating from his hands. He starts flailing around trying to get rid of it and accidentally hits Pell, knocking him to the ground. Donnie tells Percival that the light must be his magic power which gets him to calm down a bit, and as Pell gets back onto his feet, he speculates on what type of magic it could be. Maybe destruction type or enchanting type, but regardless, now that Percival has magic power of his own, he is able to fight Pell more effectively, and as such, Pell tells him to give it everything he's got. Percival rushes at Pell, and Pell swings his mace, creating a fireball aimed straight at Percival. He sees it coming and jumps out of the way to avoid it, but gets his cape caught on fire. The fireball keeps moving around and Pell explains that this is his magic pyre. The fireball he controls continually aims for Percival, and he can do nothing but jump and duck to avoid it, and not get himself roasted. Pell tells him he will never win if all he keeps doing is dodging, so Percival runs up behind him, and as he fires another fireball towards him, he spikes that shit to the ground. However, since Pell controls the flames, he uses his power to redirect the fragments of the fireball and hit Percival with all six of them, setting him ablaze. His magic fire has the property of never going out unless the target is burned to ash or Pell himself once it is stopped, so there is no other option for him aside from surrender. However, despite being engulfed in flames, he still chooses not to surrender to Pell despite his friends telling him he is going to die if he doesn't. He spreads his magic across his entire body to shield himself from the fire. Pell is impressed that even though he only just awakened his magic a minute ago, he is able to control it to such a degree that he can spread it throughout his body, but by now he is already medium rare, so Pell tells him to give up before the damage becomes too severe. However, due to Percival's determination, some of his magic congregates on Pell and forms a mini Percival on his arm and several more around him. They may be tiny, but those things are strong and start holding Pell's arms down, releasing the fire magic. But even with this, Percival has already become well done so he should be down for the count. However, he starts healing himself with the magic and Pell it is stood there thinking this dude must be hacking. Percival gets up dazed, but otherwise perfectly fine aside from his burnt clothes and Pell is trying to figure out what kind of magic he could possibly possess. It's not any type that he is familiar with, so he believes it must be the elusive hero type magic which only 1 in 10,000 possess. And if that is true, then it is highly likely that he is one of the four knights of the apocalypse that the prophecy foretold, meaning Ironside was correct in his assumption. Pell knows that once the other knights learn of Percival's power, they will surely come after him and try to execute him for being a threat, but he can't let such potential go to waste, so he can't let Percival go on his own. While he is thinking about all this, Percival walks up to him and punches him across the street and onto the ground. Pell praises Percival for his great control over his magic despite being a complete novice, and Percival is really happy with the compliments he is receiving, but since he is still a novice, 
Hell is not letting him go and starts using half of his power to break free of the mini Percivals. Even if he is talented and has a powerful magic type against a seasoned knight, he could never actually win. Donnie knows that to be true, so to say Percival, he uses his levitation magic to make Pell float in the air and tells Percival to run while he still can because there is no way he will be able to handle Pell getting serious. Percival doesn't want to run though since he still needs Pell to tell him where to find Ironside, but before long Pell gets fed up with Donnie's interference in his and Percival's fight. So he unleashes more of his power and creates a huge fireball that allows him to escape and also wounds Donnie. He wouldn't normally hurt innocent bystanders, but Donnie meddled in an honorable fight with Percival. He approaches them to finally finish the match with Percival. But then that creature that Percival met after descending the island walks in front of them, confusing Pell. It then pulls out a magic spell stone and uses it to teleport them out of the village. The three reappear on top of a dragon's backbone landmark, which is located over 30 miles away from the village they were just at. Percival wants to return there to help the others. But the fox calls him an idiot and tells him that he cannot beat Pell, and besides, Pell only came to the village looking for him. So now that he isn't there anymore, he's not going to care about the rest of the villagers and will likely just leave. Solid point, but Dunny has another point to bring up that a talking fox. The fox tells Percival to follow him, but Percival still needs Pell to tell him where he can find Iron's side. However, the fox tells him that Pell likely wouldn't know where Iron's side is even though they are part of the same team. Donnie asks who Pell is anyway, and the fox explains that he is a knight that serves under an evil king and is part of a team that was tasked with finding the four knights of the apocalypse and killing them. Donnie's never heard of the knights of the apocalypse, but that makes sense because they don't actually exist yet, but they will soon be formed. The fox was sent back here from the future to find these knights who can oppose the holy knight's power. Famine, pestilence, war, and death. And he has finally found one Percival, who is the Death Knight. Back at the Holy Knight's base, there is a meeting to discuss the information they know about the Knights of the Apocalypse when Pell walks in. They have learned that all of the Knights of the Apocalypse must be young boys as of now, and they have gotten some information about what they should look like. One boy with golden magic, one with eyes which hold both holiness and evil, and one with green wing shaped hair. Ironside hears this and realizes that last one must have been referring to Percival. As he leaves, he thinks to himself about how he messed up by not making sure that Percival was dead. Pell shows up behind him and says he had thought Ironside left Percival alive on purpose because he felt guilty killing his own son, but it turns out he just failed due to plot armor. Ironside asks why he is talking as though Percival is alive, and he tells him that he knows because he just recently fought Percival. Ironside says he hopes Pell finish him off, but Pell says it would be a waste to let such potential die out so young. This causes a conflict between the two and Ironside draws his sword, striking Pell, but Pell easily blocks it. He clarifies that it would be better to bring Percival in and train him as one of their holy knights to make sure he doesn't turn into one of the knights of the apocalypse, but Ironside doesn't like that idea because according to the prophecy, Percival is one day going to destroy the world. Meanwhile, Percival has just heard about the prophecy from the fox, but doesn't think it is a big deal because he just has to not destroy the world, pretty simple. The fox says he is free to think whatever he wants. But he just has to come with him, however. Percival says he still needs to go find Iron's side, so the fox tells him that he and the other knights are all in Camelot. Donnie doesn't believe him since Camelot was destroyed 16 years ago. Percival thinks the fox must have lied to him, but Fox Sun tells him that it still exists, although it can't be reached by normal means. If he wants to get there, he has to go through the kingdom of Leonis, and Percival is all for it despite Donnie's protests. Donnie finally agrees to go with him since Katz and Elva will probably be fine on their own. So they head to the kingdom of Leonis, which is 200 miles away, with the fox named Sin. As they finally make it off the dragon's backbone, Percival's stomach begins to growl and he gets an idea for a competition to see who can catch the best prey for lunch. Percival takes out his bow and arrow to go hunting, but Dunny remembers what happened last time and takes away the weapons until he can actually learn how to aim. He wanders around the forest and finds a gorge which looks really interesting, so he goes into it. Meanwhile, Dunny is trying to use the bow, and he's not very good, but at least his arrows go in the direction of the target. He misses one of his targets and hits a giant nun praying in the forest. They apologize, but she says it's no big deal since it didn't do much damage. Just then, two fairies come to her and say there's a short human who went into the gorge, and that particular gorge is pretty dangerous because it contains all kinds of monsters. The same monsters that Percival is currently backhanding. After he is done with killing all the monsters, he is pretty proud of himself, but soon hears a scream coming from deeper within the gorge, where this orange guy is imprisoned and about to be experimented on. Percival helps him escape, but makes the mistake of turning his back to the villain and gets injected with some mystery fluid that knocks him out. 
This guy is bad news, and due to his weird tendencies to experiment on anything that has a pulse and causing the creatures in the gorge to go crazy, he is called the Mad Herbalist, Nations. Dunny and the others are still looking for Percival after he went missing, but the fairies try to convince them that it is probably better to give up on finding him because by now Nations has probably found him, and who knows what could have happened by now. Dunny asks if Nations is really all that bad of a guy, but the fairies are sure of it. They saw his weird behavior with their own eyes while he was in the forest. He had a bunny over his lap and poked it in the ass with a needle, turning it into a monster and who wouldn't be traumatized after witnessing that shit. Knowing what kind of psycho Percival could currently be stuck with, they all hurry to try and find him before anything bad happens and on Percival's end, he is finally woken up from the mystery injection and realizes that he has been tied to a chair with nothing but his underwear on, greatly confusing him. Just then, Nations comes back in and is surprised to see that Percival had already recovered from the effects of his injection when that tranquilizer should have been strong enough to keep him unconscious for over 10 hours. It works out for him since he still has some things he wants to test out on Percival. Percival is really upset that Nations tied him to a chair and took off all his clothes telling him to at least give back the helmet and cloak he got from his grandpa as they are the only things he has to remember him by. Nations turns around and says all his clothes were tattered so he has already burnt them all. But, as for the helmet and cloak, they are still here since they are actually powerful magic items, relieving Percival. Nations then injects Percival with another mystery liquid and reminds him that he is still only a guinea pig for his experiments here. Nations says he will return in an hour since the drug should have taken effect by then, but almost immediately, Percival's hair suddenly grows even bigger than it already was. Percival is dismayed since he won't be able to put his helmet on anymore, but Nations is busy thinking about how he should be able to increase plant growth rate with this. Percival yells at Nations, accusing him of also doing evil stuff to that fairy that he kidnapped, but Nations corrects him saying the fairy was the one who intruded and attacked him first, so it was just self-defense and if it didn't want to become an experiment guinea pig, then it shouldn't have broken in. Even if that is true, Percival points out that he had blood dripping from his mouth when he first saw him so he must have bitten the fairy or something. But in reality, Nations just has a bad habit of biting down on his lip whenever he gets excited. That explains the things Percival was worried about, so Nations isn't evil. But he also should probably fix that bad habit. Nations recalls that his sister always said the same thing, and that sister is the giant girl who is currently being chased by some tree monsters. Donnie tries to climb away and the fairies blame this entire thing on Nations and his weird experiments. However, his sister adamantly denies that Nations is the type of person to do anything like this. Back with Nations, Percival now understands that he isn't necessarily evil, but he needs to be let go because there is a place he needs to go to. And Nations agrees to let him leave, but only after he is done with his experiment. It needs to be done very precisely, otherwise the backlash could very well kill Percival. He questions Nations on why he is going through all this trouble to do this, he feels no obligation to explain his actions to someone like Percival. However, as soon as he turns around, he finds that Percival has broken free of the ropes that held him and is trying to put on his helmet so he can leave because he still has his own mission to accomplish, but his hair is too big, and the helmet won't fit properly anymore. Nations can't afford to lose such a valuable test subject, so he pulls out two magic swords, promising not to kill Percival, but also fully intent on forcing him to stay here. Percival blocks the strikes and tries to talk to him saying if he is in trouble, he would be glad to help him resolve it if he knew what the problem was, but Nation sees no reason to accept a stranger's help. All he needs is a guinea pig to test the drug on so that he can save the gorge. Percival falls backwards and is at the mercy of Nations. As he is about to win their fight, Percival's helmet flies off his head and strikes him in the face, knocking him back into the table he was working on. The drug he had put so much effort into goes flying across the room and is caught by Percival. He begs Percival not to do anything to the drug and promises to let him go if he returns it, because it is very important, but Percival realizes that Nation still needs to test it out, so he takes a big swig of the mystery potion and falls to the floor, screaming. Nations is shocked that Percival would willingly drink the drug knowing it could possibly kill him, but it turns out it just gave him an energy boost and has him overflowing with power. Percival runs outside to yell at the top of his lungs, and the others hear this, realizing that he must be fine if he has the energy to yell that loudly. Nations questions Percival as to why he would drink something so dangerous without a second thought, but while he didn't know all the details, he knew Nations was doing it for the sake of saving the gorge, so he wanted to help him out. He asks if the drug had the desired effect, and from all indications, and the fact that Percival still possesses all his limbs, the drug seems to be a success. Nations thanks Percival for his help and introduces himself, before taking a swig of what is left of the drug and dropping to the floor. 
Dunny and the others come running up to the scene, and is immediately shocked by Percival's new hair. He explains everything that has happened up to this point and Mazing's wish to save the gorge, but the fairies are not buying that story at all. While unconscious, Nation speaks of a man named Ordo, who the fairies explain was a doctor who lived in the gorge. He was there before Nations and Dolores first arrived and was picking ingredients for his medicine when he was noticed by the fairies there. He told them that he is a medicine doctor and just wants to collect some things to make his medicine, but he also doesn't plan on becoming the enemy of the Lorax and destroy the landscape. So if they ever need medical help, they should feel free to come to him for help. Later on, they find the giant Dolores in the forest after she celebrated from her village and after that, a baby Nations. Ordo took Nations in and raised him as his own, teaching him all about medicine making, but then one day he disappeared from the gorge altogether with no trace of him to be found. And after that happened, Nations began all his experiments. Meanwhile, the fairy that Percival had released from Nations' house plans to destroy the whole forest before Nations can do anything to save it, and to do that, he is going to use a monster he calls Ordo. Mazins finally wakes up from his drug-induced coma and immediately tries to get up saying he needs to spread the drug through the gorge to save it. However, the fairies start throwing stones at him and telling him to leave the gorge forever because they don't want him here. Percival catches these stones and tosses them back at the fairies, yelling that Nations has been working hard trying to save them this entire time, causing them to second-guess their mob actions. Soon after, the thing that Nations was trying to prevent happens and the gorge is filled with a dense purple fog which causes all the plants and animals in the forest to immediately die as it encroaches. There is no time to spare so Nations needs to spread the drug now, however, Percival is confused about how he plans to do that because there isn't any more of the drug left and he doesn't have enough time to make a new batch. But this is where Nations' magic comes in handy. He can create and replicate any drug he has ingested before out of thin air. He warns everyone to cover their mouths before he uses his ability to spread the drug throughout the gorge and return life to the creatures in it. In order to know how to cure an illness, one must first know everything about the illness or poison and use that knowledge to their advantage. That is something Orba used to tell him all the time. Later, Percival gets a haircut and some of Mason's old baby clothes to replace the ones that were burned and the whole group of fairies begin to apologize to Nations for all their awful treatment of him, when he was only trying to help them. But he says it's fine, since while he was trying to figure out the medicine, he did actually accidentally turn some of the animals into monsters, so that part is on him. They ask him what could have possibly caused such a huge problem, but he is still unsure. After Ordo disappeared, the life in the forest started to wither away, which is what prompted him to begin his experiments. However, he never would have been able to save it if he didn't have Percival here to test the drug on him. Sin talks to Nations and tells him that the fog didn't only affect the plants and trees, but also the soil itself, leading Nations to believe that the hole in the gorge is playing some kind of role in this mess. And from that hole comes an ugly monster. This abomination shows itself, and it is apparently Ordo, or was Ordo at least. Nations tries to run over to him because he has missed Ordo for so long, but Dollars pulls him back because apparently she is the only one that has the eyes to see that something wrong is going on here. The monster Ordo fires off its breath and covers the forest in more dense fog that causes life to wither away. So Mazians runs up to him and begs him to stop because he is hurting the forest. However, the only thing on monster Ordo's mind is the destruction of the gorge, and it grabs Nazians' intent on crushing the life out of his low body. However, Dolores comes to the rescue and pulls Nazians out from Ordo's grasp, but gets hit with the poisoned breath, leaving her with the arm in treatment. The fairy returns, and it is clear that he is the one that did this to Ordo. So basically, Percival caused a huge chunk of this mess when he let him escape earlier. Nations is distraught that his grandfather was injected with the spinal fluid, but Percival promises to help get him back to normal. But even though that is his intention, there isn't exactly a book on how to fix this, and they don't have a birthfold either, so I don't see how he plans to restore Ordo. Sin tells him he might have to get rid of that fairy if he wants to get Ordo back to his previous state. However, before they can take a crack at it, the fairy gets sniped with an arrow to the forehead and falls to the ground. The others have no idea where that shot came from, but Sin directs their attention to Ordo who collapses as well. They see a holy knight above them and Percival yells for him to identify himself. His name is Talisker and he is the Ember Knight of the Eternal Kingdom. Hearing that he is a holy knight, he realizes that Talisker must be friends with Ironside. Nations yells at him for what he has done to Ordo, so the knight lands on the ground saying he will tell them everything they want to know if they can manage to land even a single hit on him. Sin warns Nations not to fall for such obvious provocation. But it's too late, and he is already in fight mode. Talisker notices that Nations has magic of both an alteration type and enchantment type, which is pretty rare as far as magic users go. 
Percival says he will fight alongside him, but Nasian says it is too dangerous for him as someone without magic power. Percival just smiles and goes into Dragon Ball's stance to release his magic, but nothing happens. He continues to push, and eventually, a gas comes out. But it wasn't very magical. Nations thanks Percival for wanting to help, but this is something he has to do on his own. Nations rushes towards Talisker, who raises his axe to the sky and summons a storm. Sin warns Nations of the incoming attack as a wall of hailstones come crashing down on him. By every indication, Nations should be dead, but Percival somehow ran in front of him and pushed him back to avoid the hailstones. That's some serious speed right there, but he must have been on cooldown because he does nothing to react to Ordo smacking Nations away from behind. Talisker says it's time to end this and orders Ordo to finish him off, but Percival's speed cooldown must have ended because he makes it just in time to stop the lunch from hitting Majins, but for some reason decided to block it with his head instead of his hands. He isn't going to let Talisker force Ordo to kill Majins after he has spent so much effort protecting this place. Talisker yells for Ordo to finish it, but it seems Percival managed to get through to him as he begins to cry and call out to Majins. Talisker has grown tired of this, and if Ordo isn't going to listen to him, then he will just crush him along with all the others and call down another hailstorm to kill him. However, Percival's speed is back up and running again, so he leaps on top of Ordo and jumps into the air, proceeding to throw hands with a storm. The others are just standing there watching like, damn, this kid is really boxing with a storm. After he is done, Percival lands on the ground bleeding and exhausted, causing him to fall to the ground, but before he lands, Dunny slides in and catches him. Nations questions why he would do something so dangerous. But Percival just wanted to save Ordo so that Nations will eventually be able to turn him back to normal. And while Nations still isn't sure how they are going to do that, he trusts Percival's word. Talisker is about to attack again when suddenly, Percival begins to glow with a blinding yellow light has managed to awaken his magic power again. Talisker is shocked because he has never seen magic power like Percival's own and the Nations are equally shocked. Even though he was in really bad shape just a second ago, he is completely healed and is producing even more magic than when he faced the Black Knight. If Percival's power allows him to heal, and Talisker says he will just crush Percival so badly that there will be nothing left to regenerate from. He calls down a massive hailstorm, and makes it hit exactly where Percival is standing. The hail hits the ground and Talisker is sure that he must have been turned to mince meat by an attack like that, but Percival's magic shields him by absorbing all the stones and afterwards, fires them back at Talisker. He is forced to dodge, and is brought to his knees as Percival walks up and reminds him of the deal he made at the beginning. If he managed to land a hit on Talisker, he has to tell him everything he wants to know and fix Ordo. Talisker yells out in a rage because he is losing and swings his axe at Percival, but the axe doesn't even draw a drop of blood. He swings at him several more times, but Percival is still standing perfectly intact. Talisker praises Percival's defensive capabilities, but he doesn't think he will ever be able to land a hit on him with those bare hands. Never mind, that will do it. Now that Percival has managed to land a hit on Talisker, he demands to know what he did to Ordo that made him like this. He was a kind person who gave medicine to the fairies and took in a stray giant, why does he have to suffer like this? Talisker says that's the problem since saving other beings aside from humans is outrageous. Ah, so he is racist. He says that what King Arthur desires is a world where all the other inferior races have been eliminated and only the pure-blooded humans can live in peace. Talisker had warned Ordo not to aid the other races in the forest, but he didn't listen to the warning and continued to help them, which is why he turned Ordo into a monster. Percival thinks that is the dumbest reason he has ever heard for turning someone into a monster, but Talisker stands firm by his racism. He then uses his magic to control the weather once more and summon lightning upon Percival. The blast is a direct hit, but it does no damage once more as Percival's magic shields him and absorbs the lightning. He runs towards Talisker with the lightning and uses it as his own attack while Talisker has finally recognized him as one of the foretold four knights of the apocalypse. He manages to dodge Percival and thinks this is a good opportunity to make sure that the prophecy does not come to pass by killing Percival. The others go to Percival and tell him that his power seems to take the shape of whatever he imagines, so he should imagine a weapon. But make sure it is not a bow, because Percival still sucks at using those. Talisker uses his strongest attack, forming a bird from all the power he has, and this creates an image in Percival's mind at the time he cut up a rock bird for dinner. So he forms a knife and gets the others to let him cook. In an instant, the magic bird is sliced up perfectly and ready for seasoning, but before that, Percival launches his knife at Talisker, knocking him into the cliff. Talisker has been defeated, so Sin tells Percival that he can deactivate his magic now, which he tries to do, but Percival doesn't know how. Donnie turns around and finds that Dolores is actually alright, but she's black now. 
Sin explains that she used a skill called Heavy Metal which giants are able to use to protect themselves. Nations is happy to see that she is still alive, but Ordo is still a monster right now. He recalls the dream that Ordo had about curing the illness of everyone, including all the other races and begins to cry, saying he will protect the valley for the sake of Ordo. Percival is watching this and feels bad for not being able to keep his promise to get Ordo back to normal. Then Sin manages to find a purple stick that was dropped by Talisker before he was defeated by Percival, and as soon as he destroys it, Ordo begins to transform and revert back to his old self, and somehow regenerates his clothes as well. They are all overjoyed to have him back and Nasians runs over to him crying and gives him a big hug. Later, Donnie is having a laugh about how Nasians was all serious earlier, but as soon as he saw Ordo again, he broke down in tears. But Percival says it's not a bad thing since he would love it if he were able to see his dead grandpa again. Donnie realizes he stepped on a conversational landmine and tries to change the subject. He asks Sin what the stick that transformed Ordo was and is informed that it was a staff of chaos which King Arthur gives his subordinates to hold the power of chaos. Percival gets up and says he has decided what he is going to do. He got blown away by his father and here, here he had to fight Talisker as well. So he's going to go after the one giving all the orders and beat up the King of Camelot so no one else is hurt. Donnie thinks this is crazy talk, but Sin is supportive and says they are going to need to prepare for it. First, they are going to aim for Linus, but Percival's stomach growls, reminding him of the game they were playing to see who would catch the most animals. Donnie didn't catch a single thing, but while Percival caught a bunch, he doesn't have any of them here to show, but Sin does. Sin wins the competition and so he becomes the leader and can give orders to them now. Before they leave, they hear Nasians calling to them from a distance and wait for him to catch up. He says he wants to follow them on their journey, but Percival wonders why. He says he wants to help because Percival saved the valley in Ordo, but he says he doesn't need to be paid back. Nasians insists says Ordo also told him to leave the valley to travel the world and learn more about it. Dunny is against the idea, but Sin agrees to it and orders him to accept Nasians in their group because his mastery of poison and magic could prove to be useful during their journeys. Percival welcomes him with open arms and Nasians is just happy to be a part of a team with the first person he could ever call a friend. In a castle, Ironside is greeted by a man whom he asks how the search has been going. The man apologizes and says he has only gone as far as to find out that the target is located in this city, but he has yet to actually locate it, and it continues to elude them even now. So Caden promises to redouble his search efforts in order to find it. But Anna, the girl standing beside him, can tell that something is terribly wrong with Caden, and even more so with Ironside. Immediately after she thinks this, Ironside begins talking about how beautiful she has gotten since she turned 16, like the creepy uncle everyone forgets to uninvite from the party. And now that she's legal, he would have liked to get her to marry his son if she doesn't mind. She clearly minds, but Caden is sucking up to Ironside so much that he is fully willing to sell his daughter off. She doesn't know what to say, but luckily Ironside was only joking after all, he plans to kill his son, if he ever actually finds him. He also asks her to keep an eye out for the thing he and her father are looking for, called the Fragments of the Coffin of Eternal Darkness. Meanwhile, Donnie and Percival are both in a field training their magic power. Dunny uses his telekinesis to grab a fish out of the water and Percival tries to order around his magic mini people, but they don't care in the slightest and keep doing their own thing. He asks Sin why his magic won't listen to him and is informed that magic is a reflection of the user's personality. So I'm sure his magic is dumb as hell. And Nations is just over there testing out some deadly neurotoxins on the mini Percivals. Changing the topic, Sin asks Percival about the sword he conjured up with his magic when he was fighting against Taliska. So Percival shows him what he was imagining to create a sword like that. It's the kitchen knife that his grandpa used. He calls its name and the sword grows in size, not looking very much like a knife anymore. Sim points out that the mysterious growing knife is most definitely a magic sword, however. Percival maintains that it must be a knife because that is what his grandpa told him it was. With a magic sword as a knife and an enchanted helmet and cloak, they are beginning to wonder just what Percival's grandpa did to come into possession of power items such as these. Percival wouldn't be able to answer because he never really learned much about his grandpa, and the dead tell no tales, so there's no way he's finding out now. Same thing with Ironside, all he knows is that he's a holy knight and that he killed his grandpa. But even so, he is going to do whatever it takes to go to Camelot and find him to deliver the beating he deserves. Though Majans has his doubts about the existence of Camelot, it should have been destroyed 16 years ago. But Percival trusts Sin's word and chooses to believe that Camelot still exists and they can get there somehow. If Percival wishes to trust Sin, then the others are willing to go along with him, so they end the discussion and sit down to have a break. 
After they had finished devouring the fish Dunny snatched out of the water, they are all stuffed and find it incredibly difficult to move. While filled with the laziness of Food Crash, Percival wishes his magic could make him fly so he wouldn't have to deal with the journey. But then they remember that Sin had some kind of teleportation device when they first met and ask him to use it again to get them to the Kingdom of Lioness. However, he tells them that he can't because he already used the last one of those magic balls last time. Donnie and Percival are upset and ask why he didn't just take them to Lioness Director then, but he retorts that there was no way he could think about that in the heat of the moment back then, and since they don't have money for an Uber, they're just going to have to accept that they need to walk. Masons asks if they happen to be talking about a magic ball as he had heard that one of the seven deadly sins, Magic Merlin had sealed several magic powers of different kinds and orbs, but more importantly, he is also said to have a library full of various poisons, getting Masons a little excited and causing him to bite his lip. Percival has to step in to stop him from doing permanent damage. They get walking and eventually make it all the way to the village of Sustana. And as soon as they arrive, Percival's magic begins reacting to something, directing him towards the tree with something buried under it. Ignoring the possibility that he may be desecrating someone's grave, Percival digs it up and finds one of those coffin fragments. Sidon seems to know what that is, and so does Anna as she appears behind the group and questions them on why they are here, while also threatening them. She thinks they are here to give that fragment to the Holy Knight, but Donnie tries to explain that they just happened to find this thing. But she doesn't buy for a second that they just waltzed into town and dug a hole right where the fragment was buried by accident. She draws her sword without hearing them out, and Dunny pulls out his knife to defend himself, but gets no diffed and is eating a face full of dirt. Nations saw Dunny get annihilated and decided right there that he didn't want to fight her, but she wanted to fight him, so he didn't have a choice, but to get a taste of the ground as well. She then declared that no matter what, she would get them to give back that fragment, and Percival just hands it over. It usually isn't that easy, so she is taken aback, but she still doesn't believe they are innocent. She can see the darkness in people, and while Dunny and Nasians don't have much, there is still darkness within them. However, when it comes to Percival, his brain is too smooth to hold any lies, so he is completely clean. So she realizes that he was telling the truth when he said they accidentally dug it up. They were only following these little guys, so they had no idea what they were digging for. They ask her who the holy knight she was talking about earlier is, but their conversation is interrupted by a maid who has come to fetch her, since the lord is currently looking for her. She tries to hide the fragment since everyone in town is looking for that thing. She stuffs it in Percival's cloak, asking him to never show it to anyone, otherwise Ironside will get his hands on it. Hearing that name, there is a lot that Percival wants to ask, but he gets cut short as Anna has to go now. The guys get a room in an inn and wonder what the item they have could be since Anna was so worried about keeping it hidden. Sin says he knows what it is, but this is the first time he has ever personally seen one. It's a fragment of the Coffin of Eternal Darkness, a legendary magical item that was created by a giant craftsman long ago. Nations notices that Percival has been awfully silent lately, so he asks if there is something bothering him. Since Anna mentioned Ironside, he knows he must be coming to this town at some point, so he is going to go and beat him. But before he does anything rash, Sin tries to talk some sense into him, reminding him that the chances of him winning are pretty slim. And even if he could win, his fight would definitely have several civilians caught up in the mayhem if he went out right now. Their primary focus right now should be gathering information. Is Ironside actually here? And if he is, what is he planning to do with the fragment? Once they have that information, they can decide what to do next. In the castle, Anna's father is trying to persuade her not to go out anymore because it can be really dangerous out there, but she retorts that he lets a mysterious man such as Ironside move around freely in the city, which is arguably more dangerous. He knows of her ability to see the evil in people, so he is sure that she is right about Ironside being evil, but the dude has the power to level mountains with his fingers, so Caden doesn't want to push his luck by aggravating him. She says he should stop being such a wimp and stand up for the people because she will become a holy knight one day and will surely protect the city if anything happens, but her father has had enough of this conversation and bitch slaps the freedom of speech out of her. He then gets called by the maid informing him that it is time for an arrangement he had planned. He meets with Ironside while Percival and the others watch from a nearby rooftop. Ironside unveils a relic fragment which fits perfectly with the piece that Percival found and Sin can tell that something very bad will happen if he manages to complete that relic. The relic was originally used by the demon tribe, but to activate it, the goddesses had to sacrifice themselves. It was sealed away and he tells them he'll explain in detail later, but right now, the problem is the process to activate it. He assumes Ironside has gathered all the people here to use them as sacrifices to activate it, meaning the entire town would be in danger. Percival wants to leap into action immediately, 
but Sin tells him to calm down since fortunately, the final piece to complete the artifact is still in their hands so he can't activate it. Percival still wants to go because he has been after Ironside this entire time, but with his current ability, he would only put himself and the civilians in danger. Ironside is lying through his teeth, asking the citizens for their cooperation in his plan to complete the ceremony because it will save them, but Anna is not going to sit by and listen to this man lie like a politician during election season. She calls him out, but he tries to play it off like she's mistaken, however. After she states that it is her magic power that allows her to see his lies, he grabs her and is prepared to silence the lie detector. Sin runs back to the inn to secure the piece of the relic while Percival jumps down and distracts Ironside to let him and Anna escape. Ironside fires off one of his crosses, but it narrowly misses them they flee under the cover of the dust. As Sin and the others return to the inn, they see the maid holding the relic fragment and then turn into this thing before flying away with and handing it over to Ironside. Kate has finally wised up a bit and tries to stop Ironside, but he is too weak, and it's too late as he has combined the pieces. Sin briefs the others on the situation and tells them they need to stop the ritual before Ironside can kill all the people in the city. If they can manage to get even one piece, then it will be their victory. They all agree to help stop the ritual, but Anna can see that Sin is lying about something here. Before they go, Sin reminds Percival not to fight Ironside head-on because he is at least ten times more powerful than he is now, so they all run off to accomplish their rules while Ironside has begun the ritual. As he does this, Black Boo begins to rise up from the ground and fly off into the city to accept the sacrifice. And once it hits the ground, it soaks in and transforms into a rock monster with a hideous jawline and equally, anything that is touched by the darkness becomes a monster hell-bent on munching on humans. Ironside instructs his familiar, Dorak, to take charge of the monsters and make sure that no human makes it out of town alive. Dunny sees all the monsters and is horrified by the carnage he is witnessing. But Percival says it's alright since Sin will come up with a plan to stop Ironside as soon as possible. Anna informs him that with her special power, she can tell that Sin is lying about something to them so she can't understand why he puts so much trust in a random fox he met a week ago. But Percival still wholeheartedly believes in him and it's not like today is the first time he's acted suspiciously. So they just decide to follow Percival's belief. They run through the streets and find Anna's father lying slumped against a wall. She rushes to his side to see if he is still alive, and luckily he is just unconscious, so they shift their attention to Ironside, who is still maintaining the spell. Without looking back, he addresses Percival and says he was originally planning to kill him here, but he is busy right now, so he doesn't have time to deal with him. He unleashes a wave of power and the bodies of the others betray them as they are scared stiff by the power he is emanating, but Percival is able to maintain his composure and run up to him to strike with a magic hand. However, it does no damage as the magic is dissipated by Ironside before it can hit him. The others can't believe he was able to counter an attack like that without even turning around, but they try to remind Percival that his mission is not to defeat Ironside, it's to stop the ritual. Percival hadn't forgotten, so he used his magic mini people to go after the Coffin of Darkness, but as they tried to break it, they were destroyed by a flash of power. Percival's magic dissipates again, and he is left confused as to why it didn't work. Seeing that Percival went straight for the coffin instead of him, Ironside can tell that his true objective is to stop the ritual, but Percival says he doesn't have to confirm that. Seeing that he might actually be a threat this time, Ironside raises his fingers and begins casting a Nova Cross, and Percival has first-hand experience with what those things can do, so he warns everyone to dodge the strike before it is completed. And it's a good thing he wanted them, because after that strike, the ground is carved up, and that wouldn't have otherwise been their bodies. Taking one look at the damage, they can all tell that Ironside is powerful enough to kill them in a single hit. Ironside starts talking about it being disrespectful for Percival to attack his father, but I think he lost the father right back on murder attempt number one. Anna is shocked to hear that Ironside is Percival's father, and from what the others know, he is the one that killed Percival's grandfather, which is why he wants to fight him so badly. Aside from that, Dunny says they need to run away quickly. Ironside is way too dangerous, and with how he acts, even if they were babies, he wouldn't hesitate to kill them all. Nations asks what will happen to the villagers if they just leave, but Dunny has known this village for one day, he sees no reason he should get himself killed for people he has never met before. Nations thinks he is being unreasonable, but Anna kind of agrees with him, thinking this is the town's problem, so she can't ask strangers whom she attacked upon first meeting to sacrifice their lives to save it. This is something she must do on her own. Nations says he is not going to run away and leave them behind. But Dunny can't say the same because he immediately gets stepping and leaves them behind. Percival continues to attack Ironside and says if he can't stop him from doing the ritual, then he is just going to break the coffin altogether. Ironside doesn't think that's a funny joke and fires off several crosses at Percival. 
He manages to dodge them by jumping upward, and asks the other to go after the coffin while he keeps Iron Side busy. But honestly, this is light work for Iron Side, so he isn't losing focus by fighting him at all. As they clash, Iron Side uses his sword to cut Percival's magic in two. He then tells him his swordsmanship is pretty good, but it would only work on a bird on a cutting board. He then raises his sword to strike Percival down once and for all, but gets stopped by Anna who is angered to learn Ironside killed his own father, and now wants to kill his son. And Ironside is just annoyed that this girl that keeps pretending to be a holy knight is interfering with his plans again. She continues to attack him and proclaims again that she will become a holy knight that will truly protect the town from evil. All while Ironside parries every one of her attacks without even turning to look. He then asks if she thinks she can fight with her clothes in that state, and soon after, her clothes rip apart. But rather than be embarrassed, she takes her clothes off altogether, revealing that she had a second outfit under her first one. She's paying Percival back for saving her earlier, so she isn't going to back down for any reason. Ironside sees her courage and is impressed, finally turning to face her and saying she should try to land a hit or even just a scratch on him. But soon after he had made his challenge, the nausea effect hits and his body begins to feel numb. This was the work of Nasians as he used his poison magic to weaken Ironside. That's some nice teamwork. But Ironside has grown fed up with their constant tricks and traps, so he is starting to take this whole fight a little more seriously and prepares to show them what true pain is. He throws some glowing red dust into the air and the group just stands there like it isn't a clear indication that this thing is an attack. Even Anna's father was able to realize what was coming, and there was enough time for him to run to his daughter's side, so there really shouldn't have been a reason they couldn't dodge. But in the end, they get hit with the attack as dozens of smaller crosses strike them repeatedly. The aftermath leaves a smoke pillar in the sky and from a rooftop in town, a man watches before heading for the epicenter of the chaos. Meanwhile, Donnie is still running through the streets that are now populated with nightmare fuel. After seeing this monstrosity, he turns to run in the opposite direction, really wanting to get out of this city before he gets his life revoked. With all the chaos happening around him, Donnie hears the screams of a little girl, and when he looks to see the sound's origin, he finds a girl and her mother about to get licked from head to toe and down to the bone by this monster. As they continue to cry out for help, Dunny has an existential crisis. His intention was to leave the town and never look back, but even he isn't able to turn his back on a crying girl, but with that being said, he has no idea how he is meant to defeat that thing, so he wonders what he is supposed to do. Back at the town center, Anna's father who jumped in front of her had managed to save her from getting injured, and when she asks why he would put himself in harm's way, he says it's only natural for a parent to protect their child. Normally this would be where the old man dies, but luckily, the May Percivals are hard at work healing his wounds, so he'll survive to see another day. The same goes for Nasians, but for Percival himself, the situation is looking far more dire. Ironside is astonished that Percival managed to protect his friends from the Red Crosses, and if this growth rate continues, he could very well become a genuine threat to him, so he needs to finish this now. Percival asks him why he had to go kill his grandpa, but to Ironside, it was just a natural response to the possibility that he could have been one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so no guilt is felt. Percival doesn't see that as a good reason to pull up and just kill a man, but there is also the fact that Ironside holds a major grudge against Percival's grandfather for taking something he valued greatly long ago. While Ironside is still distracted, Anna swoops in with a sword strike, but gets deflected easily. However, the additional distraction gave Percival enough an opening to try to destroy the coffin. But that too is stopped by Ironside as he throws Percival to the ground. He then stabs him through the hand, again lecturing him about being respectful to his parents. And the others are powerless to do anything but watch as Percival gets tortured. Anna tries to go help him, but Ironside threatens to break her body next time she tries to attack him, stopping her in her tracks out of fear. He then resumes beating Percival into the ground, saying that after he is done massacring the people in this town, he will move on to the city of Leonis and destroy it as well. But before that, he is going to kill Percival to make sure the four knights of the apocalypse can never meet in one place. He sees Percival's magic trying to heal his injured hand, so he stomps it into the ground to stop it from healing and calls Percival's magic pathetic. He raises his sword and stabs Percival through the stomach, while the others plea for him to stop. And as Percival looks up one final time, we see the light fade from his eyes. After that, all of his magic fades away and Ironside is sure that he is dead this time. He has now taken care of one of the four knights, so all that is left for him to do here is to kill all the people in the town to complete the ritual. Nations, through tears, runs over and pulls Percival's body back. Ironside couldn't care less about those two, so with Percival dead, he turns back to complete his ritual. Nations can't believe he is dead and tries to give him the medicine he had made to cure the gorge, but being dead, Percival is unable to drink it. Anna steps up and tries to feed him the potion with mouth to mouth, 
but Percival still can't drink it. It's not looking good for the prospects of Percival surviving, but just when all hope was lost, one mini Percival is reformed, indicating that Percival is still alive. Ironside overhears this and is shocked that Percival has somehow managed to come back to life, but it doesn't matter to him since he can simply kill him again. He launches one more red cross, but Nations gets in front of Percival's body to shield him. Due to the poison Nations had used on him earlier, his attacks have grown weaker and more imprecise, which is how Nations survived that deadly hit. Ironside gives him one last chance and tells the boy to leave this place and let Percival die if he wants to get out alive, but Nations isn't budging and will take as many hits as necessary for the sake of Percival. Anna is also going to stand by his side and defend Percival, because she owes him a great amount for all the help he has given her. As she clashes with Ironside again, Percival's magic slowly recovers as more and more of his mini Percival's reform. As Anna continues to fight with Ironside, he is still far stronger than her even in his weakened state, so he manages to give her a haircut in the middle of the battle. But while Ironside was distracted, Percival's magic had returned to full strength and had even grown stronger than it was before. At the same moment, Dunning returns, having realized that he couldn't leave his friends behind to die in a place like this, but the situation doesn't really call for his help as Percival's magic begins to overrun the area. Right now, Ironside is wishing he had double-tapped this kid and tries to do it now, but it's too late as Percival has reawakened with a new understanding of his power. It's not his alone, but for the people who believe in him. Their faith gives him power, and that is the true nature of his magic, hope. Back in the town, the various monsters are still on a rampage under the command of Ironside's familiar, and he instructs them to spare no human. No matter what it takes, they must all die in order to awaken the coffin as Ironside wants. As the mayhem continues, from a nearby alleyway, a man emerges holding several knives, and as one of the citizens about to get eaten by a monster, it has its body turned to dust in an instant. This was the work of that mysterious man, and after defeating the monster, the knife in his hand shatters to pieces, so he brings out the next one. With these knives, he continues to lay indiscriminate carnage upon the monsters and destroy them before they can tell what's happening. Explosions continue to rain down upon them as the familiar dark is left in utter confusion. Ironside contacts him to ask why the sacrifices haven't been completed yet, but while that's what Derek was doing, he has no explanation to give. All of a sudden, a bunch of the monsters started dying to a mysterious power, but he has no clue what that power is, who is doing it, or even how many of the attackers there are. He flies down to ask one of the monsters what is going on down here, but as the titan lowers its head to give an answer, it gets cleaved in two. As the dust settles, he can finally see the person responsible for the monster's death, but the man raises his knife and sends one of his strikes aimed towards Derek. He is unable to dodge and meets the same fate as the monster that perished before him, as well as a chain of monsters that were killed after him. The destruction is so widespread that even from the top of the hill, Percival and the others can tell that someone is bringing down a bunch of the monsters in town. Nations wonders if it's some holy warrior, but while they don't know exactly who it is, they believe it was the work of Sin going to call in reinforcements. With the monsters being killed as they speak, even with the lives that were already lost, Ironside will no longer be able to sacrifice enough people to activate the coffin, so he has lost. Ironside very calmly accepts his loss and briefly goes into proud father mode, telling Percival he has grown so much in such a short amount of time, and his grandfather would definitely be happy to see how powerful he has become. But seeing as he was the one who killed said grandfather, this is one time Percival wishes his father never came back with the milk. Ironside says it was just him fulfilling his duty, so he had to kill his grandfather, and moreover, he tried to kill his own son, Percival twice. He seems to be showing some amount of remorse for his actions and drops his sword to the ground. According to him, for failing his mission to activate the coffin, he will be held accountable by his lord and executed if he returns, but that is what he deserves. This one Adian personality is starting to seem really fishy. He claims to have given up, so he at least wants to see the face of his son up close one last time. Percival was beginning to fall for his talk no jutsu, but luckily, Anna was there to give him a reality check. Every word Ironside just uttered was a lie, and there is no sign of remorse or love anywhere in his heart, so now that the ritual has been stopped, all he wanted to do was to trick Percival into getting close enough to be killed at his hands. Ironside is enraged that Anna ruined his talk no jutsu trap and swears that no matter what, he will make sure Percival meets his end here. He begins rapid firing his crosses at them, forcing Percival to fly around through the sky to evade the strikes. He continues to dart through the sky at breakneck speeds and he is only capable of moving so fast thanks to the hope of his friends, so they are basically the batteries for his magic power. Ironside is still feeling the effects of Majin's poison, so he is unable to continue his barrage of attacks for a while. 
With the opening he is given, Percival turns into a bomber and rains down his magic to cluster bomb Ironside, but that was just a distraction, as it was really just a smokescreen meant to allow them to sneak up from behind him. However, Ironside saw this coming and easily countered the surprise attack. Percival remembers what Sin had told him about Ironside being far stronger than he thinks he is, and it looks like he was right about that. While he is still next to the coffin, they are limited in what they can do, so they need to get him away from it somehow, and Percival has a great idea for what they could do, and it involves Dunny. As they fly back around, Percival charges towards Ironside with his hand raised as though he were going to strike Ironside, but Ironside tells him it's useless because he isn't powerful enough to defeat him. That may be true, but today is a win for Percival since the charge was just a fake out as Dani had used his magic to make the coffin levitate, and as such, it was beyond the protection of Ironside, allowing Percival to fly up and destroy it with his magic sword. As the coffin crumbles to pieces, they keep a piece of it so it can't be reassembled. The rest of the pieces crash at the feet of Ironside, and you can tell he is pissed off because his helmet cracks open and falls to the ground, revealing his true face to. Ironside begins to mock Percival for having accomplished nothing. So what if he destroyed the coffin and took one of its pieces? That just means all they need to do is kill him and take the coffin piece back in order to continue the plan. So he has solved nothing at all. Even if there are not enough people left in this town to sacrifice, there are still many more cities on the continent and he can sacrifice any one of them for the sake of his goal. The ritual has only been temporarily stopped, so he is going to kill Percival now and stop him from interfering any further in his plans. However, he gets grabbed by another holy knight who tells him he has had his chance, but he's done here. Ironside tells Motlatch to get his hands off him because he is in a really bad mood. Motlatch backs off but tells that Ironside can't handle this alone. He has finally found one of the four knights of the apocalypse, so he would be neglecting his duties if he just let them escape. Besides, they have a bigger problem in the form of the enemy force that destroyed all the monsters in the town. The power that was used is formidable, yet they do not know who did it. Motlax doesn't know for sure who it was, but he can make a guess. The monsters that Ironside summoned were powerful, yet all of them were killed in an instant. The only person he can think of who would have the kind of power necessary to do something like that would be a legendary hero from one of the Seven Deadly Sins, or at least something similar to that. The team is shocked at the mention of the Seven Deadly Sins, but Motlak continues. If it's actually one of them here, then he's in great danger, and doesn't want to stick around to find out what they'll end up doing, so he wants Ironside to withdraw for now. Before they leave, Ironside locks eyes with Percival one last time while giving him a death stare. They then disappear into a cloud of smoke, and now that they are gone, the group finally return to the ground and collapse out of exhaustion. Percival was sure he could have died back there, but he actually did die at one point. Dunny is excited because he actually managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the best of the Holy Knights, even if it was only for a brief moment. But Anna reminds him that he ran away at first. Plus, if it wasn't for Percival, they would likely have actually died back there. Regardless, they all work together and manage to defeat Ironside. Anna's father calls out to her, happy to see that she is safe. She runs up and hugs him, equally happy he's alive. But now that she knows he's okay, she rubs it in about her being right about Ironside. Sin then comes back and the guys rush over to ask him who he called to handle those monsters. He lies and says he called in some friends from the forest, but Dunny isn't buying it. However, Percival bought his entire stock as he continued asking what kinds of animals they were. Now that the fight is over, he is back to being the usual goofball he is. But later we see Percival fighting with his inner demons as he comes to terms with the fact Iron's side is actually his father because he looks almost exactly like his grandfather. Ironside is giving a report to his lord and is getting made fun of for failing his mission. Even if the one who stopped him was one of the four knights of the apocalypse, he can't imagine what it must feel like to get your ass beat by a kid. He was expecting Ironside to make some excuse about the kid being really powerful, but he has nothing to say he will accept any punishment that Arthur sees fit. Arthur takes him up on that offer and has his hands and feet bound by monsters before his chest is stabbed. Arthur sees the world as being played by the suffering of humans at the hands of other species, so he wants to cleanse the world of all of those undesirables and make a world for only humans. But with the seven deadly sins and the new four knights of the apocalypse, it seems that threats to his perfect plan still exist in the world. And while that is the case, there can never truly be peace for him. All said while Ironside is still getting penetrated violently by the monster. Arthur says he doesn't want any more failures from Ironside as he is expecting great things from him. As the monster retracts its tentacles from Ironside's body, he realizes that he feels much better and Arthur informs him that the penetration was to remove the poison in his system from his last battle. Ironside promises not to disappoint him, but Arthur has another mission in mind for the Holy Knight. In this war, they've been on the back foot for far too long, 
and they were only able to gain some ground because they snooped into the future using the vision. Ironside asks if he wants him to go steal the vision artifact, but that's not it, it's something much more important than that. He wants Ironside to go wife hunting for him. Back with the group, Anna's father is thanking them for saving their town. However, there was still massive property damage and casualties. They will still be able to rebuild with time, so he owes them a great deal of thanks. Anna's father knew Ironside through his wife, and according to her, he was a good man who upheld justice. So who knows what could have happened to lead him to become the killing machine he is now. Before they go, he has one last favor to ask of them. Just then, Anna comes over and tells her father that she wants to travel to gain experience and become a holy knight. She realized that her skills were insufficient after Ironside was able to beat her so easily, so she needs to do this. However, her father refuses to let her travel alone, so he asks Percival and the others to take her with them. Anna is happy that her father is supporting her dreams and he tells her he will always have her back as he hugs her goodbye. Ani is excited to finally be getting to go on an actual adventure to become a holy knight and thinks, this is going to be a lot of fun. But Donnie reminds her that this isn't some game they're playing, it's serious. And even though her father probably wanted to be generous with her leaving the city, no matter how you look at it, that's a funky looking donkey. Ani says it's rude to insult her horse and has been her best friend since she's been a child. Meaning she has had a grand total of zero friends before the recent events. It makes sense since her ability to see through lies would probably make her unlikable to the other kids, but that doesn't matter now because she's got actual friends in the form of Percival and the others. She gets embarrassed and says she doesn't need their pity, she had no friends because she chose to have no friends. Nassians thinks it must have been hard to live like that since she would eventually get lonely, but that was simply how she lived, even if it was hard there was no way around it. Percival tries to lighten the mood by joking about how Sylvan's legs are short and stubby, smacking him on the side but Sylvan was having none of that and kicks Percival into the stratosphere. After recovering Percival's body, he is completely out of it and is being dragged by Nassians who is starting to wish they had gotten a car to go with Sylvan. Donnie agrees but Ani thinks they are just being annoying and warns that if they are too slow, she might leave them behind. And Sylvan turns his head with a smug look of I'll fucking do it again. However, she did know what she was getting herself and Sylvan into when she said that because by noon, the guys are way ahead of her and Sylvan isn't looking so smug anymore. He may be a horse, but Sylvan ain't built like that so they end up waiting for him. Now, they're all just sitting around roasting the horse for being outwalked by a bunch of humans, and Sin just looks disappointed in him. Sylvan tries to threaten Sin, but after realizing that he is not that guy, he backs off and apologizes. Anna doesn't understand why Sylvan started acting up all of a sudden, but then she remembers that she actually never asked where they were going in the first place. After they explain that the plan is to head for the Lyonnais kingdom, she becomes even more excited at the thought but that she will be getting to visit the Lyonnais kingdom where most holy knights originate from. And even better, the legendary Seven Deadly Sins Meliodas is the king of that territory. While she is talking, Percival recalls that Ironside had also said something about the Seven Deadly Sins, but he isn't sure who they are meant to be. She is shocked that someone exists in the world that doesn't know of the seven deadly sins, but in Percival's case, he had lived on that mountain island for his entire life, still one of the chances that he could have ever heard of the seven deadly sins if his grandpa never told him. She explains that Meliodas was their leader and saved the kingdom of Lioness several times over, and along with six other holy knights, he was able to defeat the demon lord. Those are the seven deadly sins and Anna has been fangirling over Meliodas for the longest time. She even has one of the limited edition wanted posters that were drawn of Meliodas, but they look almost nothing like the real deal. Donnie thinks she might have a huge crush on Meliodas, but she denies it saying she only has admiration for the leader of the Seven Deadly Sins. On that note, she remembers that they never discussed who would be the leader of their group when they first set out. Percival doesn't know what a leader is, but that's fine since he and his smooth brain were never in the runnings for being leader in the first place. He may be their most powerful force, but right now he's more of a mascot if anything. She also doesn't think Nassians would fit the role of team leader very well, and he wasn't interested in it either, but he is very calm and reliable so being the team advisor would be a good role for him. And as for Donnie, I don't think much needs to be said about him. That leaves just her to take on the role of leader, and though it's not like she wanted to be the leader from the beginning, she's willing to take on that role for the party. The others don't really care so they let herself elect herself as the team leader. Percival chimes in that Donnie isn't so bad since he ended up helping some of the people in the city, but he says it's not a big deal. Hearing that Donnie used his powers to save people, Anna asks if he is also aiming to become a holy knight, and he confirms it. But his dream of becoming a holy knight has nothing to do with her, so he doesn't understand why she is so upset by it. Sin breaks them up and tries to get everyone back on task as he pulls out a map so they can tell where they are and how far they need to go from there. 
They all gather around the map to plan their route and Anna is getting a little salty because she is meant to be the leader here. They conclude that to get to Leonais, they are going to need to cut through the Dalfury Mountains. So before they head to do that, Sin wants to go to a post town nearby called Kanto to get some things ready in preparation for their trip through the mountains. Anna is against it as she wants to get to Leonais as soon as possible, and thus thinks they should just go straight through the mountains. But Sin tells her she is being reckless and the mountains have a survival rate of almost zero, because it is an area shrouded in darkness. So if they want any chance to make it out to the other side, they need to be well prepared for it. She relents on her insistence and Percival is excited to get to see another city, while Nassians is interested to see what kinds of drugs they have there. But really, he should be more interested in getting his shirt fixed first. In a tavern in town, there is a man drinking himself to death to drown his sorrows in liquor. And while the bartender thinks he has probably had too much to drink by this point, he doesn't dare to do anything to stop him or consequently put himself in the line of fire for Amy drunken rage, because this man is no ordinary drunk. He's a holy knight, Commander Hauser. As Percival and the gang approach the city, Donnie has a flashback to the time he was training to become a holy knight under Commander Hauser. He and a friend called Edin were fighting for their training while Commander Hauser gave them instructions on how to improve their fighting capabilities. After the training was completed, they asked Hauser if they had what it takes to become a holy knight. And while he did think they were improving steadily, magic and sword skill alone would not guarantee that you could become a holy knight. What was important was how you use your power, a lesson he learned far too late in life. But not to worry because he will be sure to teach them so they don't make the same mistakes he made in life. Back to the present, the team arrive at the entrance to Kanto, and it looks far more like a fortress than a city. They make it to the general store and Miss Leader over here is getting distracted by all the pretty things available to be bought, while Nassians heads to a blacksmithing to pick up some medicine bottles. And as for Donny, he's heading to the bar to get plastered. Meanwhile, Percival is wandering through the city when he comes across a fighting ring where the champion is absolutely demolishing the competition out here. Sin rounds them all up and says they have to secure accommodations first before they do anything else, so they all head to the inn to get some rooms and a stable. The innkeeper says there are rooms available and it will cost 22 silver pieces, but they don't have their money with them because Sin gave it to Ani to manage. You know, because she is the leader. But then you see her carrying this huge bag of stuff so they might start to regret letting her rig that election in the first place. She bought tons of stuff, and while some of them are actually useful like new clothes and blankets, there's a bunch of useless and expensive stuff she bought for herself in there so they are left with only 3 silver out of the 10 gold Sin had given her. He is irate over her complete lack of frugality with their money and calls her a terrible leader. She doesn't like being reprimanded, but she also knows he's right about her spending too much money. So in a huff, she takes Percival to go return all the useless stuff she bought. In the meantime, Donnie takes Nassians to a bar to get a drink, but since Nassians doesn't drink, he orders a glass of milk for him instead. From behind, Hosser walks up and after spotting him, Donnie recoils in fear, informing Nassians that this man is a holy knight, and also his uncle. Anna couldn't get a refund so she did the next best thing and took Percival to the wrestling contest upstairs where he easily beat all the buff dudes, and with their funds restored, she heads back downstairs to return to the rest of the group. In the bar, Donnie is trying to strike up a conversation with his uncle, but the old man is still very drunk and very salty about Donnie skipping out on training all those years ago. Donnie drops the piece of the coffin and once his uncle notices it, he snatches it out of his hand claiming that Donnie must have stolen it from somewhere. He asks if Donnie even knows what it is and he is aware that it is sealing some demons, but he is meant to be keeping it safe, so he asks Hosser to return it to him. However, you know what they say about drunk uncles and Donnie learns firsthand as he falls to the floor from the force. Nazians calls Hazar out for striking Donnie while drunk for no reason, but the drunk man isn't open to reason and insults Donnie, saying his dead mother would think he is a disappointment. Donnie is in tears and runs out of the bar as Ani had just walked in with Percival happy about their winnings. She wonders what could have happened to Donnie but the answer becomes clear as Hazar then snatches the money away from Ani just because. She tries to get it back, but the drunk man keeps it away before Nassian steps in front of him and calls him out again for being a drunk idiot and hitting Donnie. Percival hears that the old man hit his friend and he is ready to throw hands, and at the first sign of fight, everyone pulls out their phones to record while they chant fight. Hauser doesn't want to fight Percival, so Nasians suggests they have a drinking contest to settle things. But as the drinks are being downed, Nasians reveals that he thinks there is something wrong with this town. But it's a little too late as Percival and Anna fall unconscious and both he and Hauser are surrounded by thieves all led by Edrin, Hauser's other disciple and Dunny's brother. Edrin approaches Hauser and talks about how he had been planning this out for a long time, while Hauser realizes that the rumors about him were true and he actually became a bandit leader. 
He had heard reports that there was a group of thieves going around and robbing travelers, but he didn't know they had occupied an entire city. He would never have thought that Edrin would stoop so low as to join them and help commit crimes. Thanks to him, it was easy for the bandits to kill the holy knights that were sent to capture them since they were able to steal their weapons. Even now, Hauser is without his weapon or horse since they are still back at the inn, yet Hauser isn't phased by his lack of weaponry, or the fact that he is surrounded by dozens of bandits that are armed. Even without his weapon, he is still a holy knight, and that should understand the kind of power he possesses. Maysians is amazed by the bravery of Hauser to be standing there in jumping territory and be completely unafraid, but I guess that's what one can expect from a true holy knight. But if you thought he was actually going to be useful in this fight, you'd be wrong because Idrin informs him that he has already lost as he begins to fall to the floor unconscious. He had been drinking here all this time, so there's no way they wouldn't spike his drinks while they had the chance. With Hauser down for the count, Nasians asks what they plan to do with them, and the bandits laugh saying they already decided to sell off the kids as slaves to the highest bidder. Nasians hears this and goes, Nah, I don't think you will before using his magic to take a page out of their book and spread a sleeping gas through the air causing all the bandits to fall to the ground unconscious. The only one who is able to withstand the gas is Idrin and he realizes that Nasians must have some kind of magical powers. Since all the bandits have been knocked out and doesn't particularly like Hauser anyway, he tells Edrin that he'll just take his friends and leave the town, but Edrin threatens to kill Percival while holding him by the neck. Nations is shocked because he was sure Percival was behind him, but when he checked, Percival was indeed behind him as he realized he got played and Edrin came up behind him to knock his lights out. Outside, Donnie is beating himself up for running away from Hauser in front of his friends. They'll definitely never let him live it down once he gets back. He thinks back to what Hauser said about how his mother would definitely be disappointed in him, and he is in himself as well. While he continues to be himself up, Edrin walks up to him with a friendly greeting. Dunny has no idea about what went down in the bar after he ran away, so from his perspective, Edrin is still just his innocent brother. Edrin says he saw Dunny at the bar earlier and wanted to come say hi, also asking if the others he had seen at the bar were his comedian routine partners. Dunny smiles a little after hearing that, and but asks why Edrin is here since the last time they had seen each other, he was supposed to be training with their uncle to become a holy knight, but instead, he informs Dunny that it was too hard for him, so he ended up quitting his dream of becoming a holy knight. Dunny couldn't believe it since he was sure if anyone could achieve it, then it would be Edrin, and he wanted to do it so badly when they were young. Edrin says that's all in the past now and offers Dunny a quick and easy way to make money instead. He pulls him in and says, have you heard of NFTs? He actually invites Donnie to pretend to be a resident of this town and steal people's stuff when they come here. Edrin says it so calmly that Donnie thinks he must be joking, but the dude is dead serious and doubles down saying they have powerful allies here that can help them achieve you do it easily. And this was when Donnie started to realize that maybe he wasn't joking after all. Edrin asks for a response, but Donnie tries to back find a way to get out of this conversation and says he'll be going back to his friends now. Edrin tells him his friends have been captured already, causing Donnie to freeze in his tracks as he processes what Edrin just said to him. Edrin continues, saying the only friend Donnie is ever going to need is him so he should just come join him in the ways of the crook, but Donnie is seriously pissed that Edrin would lay a hand on his friends. He grabs his hand and tells him he's not the same brother he knew before, he's changed and not in a good way. But Edrin doesn't think he has changed all that much, all he did was discover his destiny. Meanwhile, Percival and the others get thrown into his cell by the bandits that had captured them, and all except for Nasians are still feeling the effect of the sleeping drug so they have no chance of fighting back as the thieves look through their stuff, they find all the gold that Anna had won in the sumo contest, and take that back. But they also find the piece of the coffin, and though it is way more valuable, these guys are way too dumb to know its true value, so they just toss it back into the cell. The bandits leave after taking everything that they consider to be valuable from the kids and leave them in the cell to later be sold off into slavery. With no course of action to take, Nasians hopes that Donnie will be able to figure out that the people here are crooks and come help them, but Hauser doesn't believe Donnie will come back for them since he's a little bitch. They suddenly hear Ties, the barman, coming around the corner, and he is here to help them get out of this sticky situation. As he unlocks the gate, he tells Nasians how impressed he was by his drinking ability, he met his size, he would never be able to drink that much. Nations explains that it's not that he can drink a lot, rather with his magic power, he is able to neutralize all poisons that enter his body, so alcohol just has no effect on him. Tice enters the cell and walks up to Hauser, who is still asleep, telling him that he needs to help stop the bandits, otherwise this town will be destroyed. Hauser asks if it is because of Edrin, but no, it's something far worse. Edrin has seen how to train your dragon and got one for himself. 
And with an ancient dragon in their side, they are practically invincible since no one can beat it. Edrin once again urges Donny to reconsider and join his side so they can plunder together as brothers, but Donny just turns and runs away. Back in the cell, Majens was able to use his magic to detoxify Percival and Anna, so they wake up. Anna is confused about how they got here since the last thing she remembers is them being at the bar, but it's a whole complicated story and there's no time to explain. She then notices Hauser behind her and immediately jumps to conclusions and assumes Hauser must have gotten her drunk and tried to get her body, but Hauser just laughs it off since he isn't trying to get himself arrested. Anna is hurt by how he is unaffected by her womanly charms, so she pretends to start crying and gets Percival angry at Hauser, so Percival attacks him for what he did, in addition to how he treated Dunny back there. After headbutting his gut, Percival was about to knock him out when Majens told him to stop since this guy is Donnie's uncle. Hearing this, they stop their attacks, but that headbutt already did too much damage so Hauser throws up all over them. As Donnie was running away from Edrin, Edrin ordered the rest of the bandits to capture him, but not hurt him as he was still precious family. So as they chased after him, Edrin told the dragon to go back to its nest until he called for it again. And if the monster disobeyed, he would smash the dragon egg that he was holding hostage. The dragon reluctantly obeyed and left the scene and soon after, the bandits returned having failed to capture Dunny. Edrin ordered them to search every inch of the town until they find him since he couldn't have gone far, but the bandits are growing impatient and these guys aren't scared to go on the offender watch list, so they ask if they can go down to the cell and get a taste of the kids. Edrin tells them firmly that they are not to do anything else without his permission until they find Donny, but as he turns his back, the bandits start thinking about getting rid of him. In the cell, Tice explains how he met Edrin. He came into town looking defeated after he gave up on his dream of being a holy knight, but as Tice tried to talk to him, but he just paid his tab and left. Then a couple of days later, he returned with a bunch of bandits, having been taken in by them. He joined the group by pulling off the crazy stunt of stealing a dragon's egg, and with that egg, the dragon is basically forced to do whatever they want. There were rumors about it going around, which is probably why Hauser came here in the first place. But still, even if they are using the dragon egg to keep the ancient dragon in check by intimidating it, they can't keep it up forever since once that egg hatches, their intimidation tool will be gone. Tice confirms this and explains that the egg he has right now is a fake one, but the others wonder how he was able to fool a dragon like that. Hauser gets up and explains that Edrin's magic is imitation magic and allows him to create illusions that look just like real objects, just like he did with Percival's body, but it's only a matter of time before the dragon figures it out and once that happens, it will go on a rampage and destroy the city. Hauser doesn't care and wants to let Edrin suffer the consequences of his actions, but Tice explains that the bandits are also going to turn on Edrin soon, they have started hating him because he never lets them violate women and children like they did before they met him, plus he wouldn't let them kill the holy knights they stole from, he would just capture them, and eventually they would all somehow escape. He's just a good kid trying to act gangsta to fit in, but right now, he's been backstabbed and left wounded on the ground while the bandits dance around because they've got the dragon egg now. But that only lasted for about 10 seconds because they immediately lost it afterwards. The dragon has realized the egg was a fake and is now terrorizing the town. In the cell, they hear the chaos going on outside after the egg illusion was found out but also discover that the real egg has already hatched into a baby dragon. It is sick from being trapped underground for so long, so Majens tries to give it some medicine to recover first. Meanwhile, outside Edrian was caught in the chaos and falling to his doom before Donnie saved him with his float magic. Edrin uses this time to catch up properly with Dunny and finds out that he is trying to become a holy knight again. Dunny had given up on that dream because he doesn't want to die, but then he met someone who was willing to risk his life to save others. Although Percival has healing hacks, but it still inspired him. Percival tells Dunny and Edrin to jump, and as the dragon tries to roast them alive, Percival's magic forms a mega Percival around them, absorbing the fire and blasting it back at the dragon. But even that wasn't enough to beat this beast. We see a flashback of Dunny and Edrin having a practice match under the supervision of Hauser, and as Dunny makes a wild swing at Edrin, he gets dodged and smacked on the head, causing him to drop his sword and scream in pain. Hauser reprimands him for letting go of his sword, even if it is just a simulated battle. He is not going to get any mercy, so Hauser gives Edrin the green light to finish Dunny off. However, while Edrin may have been better at swordplay than Dunny, Dunny had the Joe Star family secret move. As he runs away, Edrin yells that running is not something a holy knight would do, but as Donnie tricks him into letting his guard down, he reveals his master plan was actually to ambush him while his back was turned, but that doesn't work out for him like he thought it would, and he ends up on the floor. Later, they all sit by the river as Donnie faces the fact that he might not be cut out to be a holy knight after all, 
And yes, while he's a bit of a coward and has a tendency to run away, Edrin still had his back and wanted to become a holy knight alongside him. Back to the present, the dragon's rampage is starting to get out of hand, and Tice is worried that the cell is going to collapse at some point. He asks Nasians if he is done healing the baby dragon. But the baby does not have the strength to swallow, so he is having it absorb the medicine in mist form through its skin. Hauser drunkenly notices that Sin has been staring at him for quite some time now and starts arguing with what he believes to be a regular fox, but then that fox starts calling him pathetic, and he sobers up real quick. He's seen a talking pig before, but never a talking fox however, and that's beside the point. Sin tells Hauser that he has gravely misjudged Dunny. The fragment of the coffin that he assumed Dunny stole was actually secured from the hands of one of the evil holy knights of King Arthur, and Dunny played a huge role in getting it, so his actions helped save the entire city alongside the others in the team. Hauser and also wrongly presumed the others to be a part of some kind of circus act that Donnie was a part of, but he couldn't be more wrong. For instance, Percival, while he may look like a circus act, he is actually someone that Sin was sent to find under secret orders from the Kingdom of Lioness. Hauser can't believe what he is hearing, but according to Sin, Percival is one of the prophesied four knights of the apocalypse. However, he only just recently awakened his powers, so his capabilities are still far from sufficient for what he is supposed to do, and that much is apparent since he is losing against the dragon. Hauser realizes he has made a terrible error in judgment, so he looks over to Nasians that is still healing the dragon and asks him to use his magic to get the alcohol out of his system, so he can make himself useful. Outside, Percival yells for Anna to take Dunny and Edrin and get away from here, but Dunny doesn't intend to leave Percival behind. Percival charges up and releases his mini Percival attack, and though they are furiously pounding away at it, they are much too small and cute to do any real damage. The dragon launches a counter at Percival, and as the dust settles around him, it seems he has had his back blown out once more. But in reality, that was just a copy made with Edrin's illusion magic, and the real Percival was dragged away before he could join the Donut Club. Even though he nearly died again, Percival is still just amazed to see a dragon in person, since it is just like his grandpa always told him it would be. None of his attacks work against it in the slightest, although he isn't taking the fight all that seriously since he is enjoying it. So Dunny asks if he would stand a chance of winning if he actually took the fight serious, but the answer is no. And to make matters worse, Sylvain trips on a rock and leaves them all out in the open without a means of escape, and the dragon has noticed them. So they are forced to just run away on foot. However, the wind picks up as they see Hauser walking towards them, but Percival and Aneth still see him as a weak old jerk. The only one who knows what happens when Hauser gets serious is Dunny, and he can assure them that the dragon stands no chance against him. The dragon takes a deep breath and lets out a torrent of fire aimed at Hauser, but he gets into stance and draws forth a mighty tornado to intercept the flames, utterly shocking both Percival and Anna. The dragon then tries to slash at him with its claws, but that gets countered by another wind blast from Hauser, sending the dragon flying several meters. Hauser then stares down the dragon as it charges at him with another attack, but as it gets in close, Hauser dodges into the air, and this time he doesn't just create a tornado, he becomes the tornado. The dragon is overwhelmed and picked up by the force of the wind while the others are left amazed because they didn't realize Hauser was this strong. Sixteen years ago, this man fought and won in the holy war against demons. He is the true embodiment of a holy knight. With the dragon defeated, Dunny runs up to him along with Edrin to say just how amazed they were by his feat of strength, so he turns around and asks if they are alright. In the back, Anna is still shocked by what she just witnessed, but Percival has moved past the initial state of shock and is now in full-on fan mode. He runs up to Hauser, excited to finally see a real holy knight, and begins bombarding him with questions on how he can become one as well. He gets down on his knees and begs Hauser to train him to get stronger, but while Hauser isn't against it, he isn't exactly all for the idea since there are many other people in this world that are stronger than him. So maybe he isn't the best teacher to ask. Just then, they hear the sound of the baby dragon flying overhead and look up to see Sin and Nasians riding on its back. They get down and Nasians informs everyone that he has successfully gotten the baby dragon back to full health, so they let it fly to reunite with its mother. However, its mother is on the ground and not moving, so Nasians worries that they already killed it, but there's no need to worry since Hauser was careful to leave the dragon alive. But that also causes Anna to worry that it will start destroying the city again, but Hauser doesn't think that'll happen anytime soon since it was only doing all that because it had its child stolen, so of course it would be angry, but now that it has its kid back, it should calm down. And even if it did attack again, he would personally handle it. Edrin begins to walk away, but Hauser asks him where the hell he thinks he's going. He says he is a wanted man now and has done things that cannot be forgiven, and yeah, he kidnapped a baby dragon and led to the destruction of the city, so he probably should be behind bars, but rather than do that, 
Hauser just punches him. He calls Edrin pathetic for assuming he didn't have enough power to become a holy knight and turn into a life of crime, but then again, Hauser is just as pathetic as him. Back when he was training Edrin, he would always go hard on him and any time he would try to use his magic in combat, Hauser would make it clear that a shadow clone that can't move is useless in combat, so his magic isn't suited for fighting. Instead, he wants Edrin to hone his sword skills to a level on par with his own, however, Edrin doesn't believe he will ever be able to become that good and rather than acknowledge his feelings, Hauser told him not to become a failure just like an Asian dad would. But he realized something looking back on that day, he is the true failure of a master because he couldn't see that a holy knight doesn't need to only possess the power to hurt others. So he asks Edrin to stand up because they are going to have to start training over from scratch to get him to holy knight status. He also turns to Donny and apologizes for hitting him earlier and not being able to trust what he said. But in the past, Donny was so scared of dying. So what could have changed him so much to pull off a crazy stunt like this? Donny explains that before his mother died, her last wish was for Donny to live a long and happy life. So after hearing his mother's wish, it became hard for him to justify risking his life for others. So he always resorted to running away. However, now he doesn't think like that anymore since he realizes that protecting his friends in danger is what makes him happy, so he is willing to risk his life for them. He goes over to Idrin and apologizes because he can't stay and train with him, but he also promises that he won't run away from being a holy knight this time, so he asks Edrin to become one alongside him as well. This brings a smile to Hauser's face, but he also wants them to try to become holy knights before he gets too old and retires. They all laugh and Dunny asks if it means he can have the piece of the coffin back, but Hauser first wants to make sure Dunny is aware of what this means. The coffin has the power to change the tide in the upcoming war, but that means that as long as Donnie is carrying this thing, the Knights of King Arthur will be coming after him in full force. But Donnie hadn't thought about that, and his face says it all. He's not cut out to keep life-threatening treasures, so he briefly goes back to being a coward and hides behind Anna. He wants nothing to do with that thing anymore, so Percival volunteers to hold it. Back in what is left of the town, Hauser is working on a sword, and Tice is surprised he has the know-how to do something like this. Hauser's dad was a blacksmith. So when he was young, he would help around the forge a lot and picked up a few tricks. Besides, it's not like Hauser is making a sword from scratch, he's just taking the blade of an already made sword and attaching a handle to it. If Percival is a prophesied knight, then he at least needs to have a sword on him to make him look the part. So before they leave, Hauser hands Percival the sword made with a coffin piece as its handle. By the way, Hauser asks Sin if he has informed their king that he has found Percival yet, but he hasn't. He wanted to make sure of a lot of things first. But Hauser is right, Sin probably should have made a report by now on what has happened. So he walks away from the crowd and turns back into a human before standing at the edge of a cliff and shooting an arrow into the sky as a message to his king. And over in the kingdom of Lioness, we see a very familiar face in the castle handling the matters of the kingdom when that arrow flies overhead, and he immediately knows that it means that Sin has found one of the knights of the apocalypse, so he is eager to meet this person. The group camp out for the night in preparation for the journey they are going to take tomorrow is going to be a tough one, so they'll need to get every bit of rest that they can, yet Anna can't help but feel anxious about it, so she's unable to sleep. With that being the case, Percival suggests that they talk about something really interesting, which piques Anna's interest, but when he reveals that he wants to come up with names for his weapon and powers all night, everyone is suddenly feeling really sleepy. Later into the night, Sin wakes up and hears something calling out to him, so he wanders into the fields to find it and sees this bride standing in the open. The woman seems to know his name, which catches him off guard, but before he can ask any questions, he wakes up and realizes it was all a dream. He is really confused by what just happened, but he won't be able to get the answers he is looking for now, so he decides to just go back to sleep. The next morning, Nations is complaining that they have to climb this huge mountain first thing in the morning, and I don't blame him, but they are almost at the top. So Percival gives him a push, so they can all make it up together. Meanwhile, they are being watched by a man and his dog from another hilltop. Percival, Dunny, and Nasians finally make it to the top of the hill, but they are horrified to see that they still have several more mountains to climb. Sin informs them that it will take another four days before they reach Lioness, but with Nasians and his string bean legs tagging along, it will probably take twice as long to get there. To save time, Percival offers to give Nasians a piggyback ride, all the way up because he's never heard of the word tired, but while they are doing that, Sin notices a lone bird flying in the sky, and if we've learned anything by now, it is that you never trust birds. The group continues down the mountain when all of a sudden, Percival suddenly stops because something really important just came up. He has to go pee, and so does Donnie. They rush down to find a place to pee, and as they answer the call of nature while also breaking the Uranal Bro Code, they find buildings behind the bushes, and no matter how you look at it, this is clearly a village. 
Anna finds this suspicious, especially since Sin says he can sense an unknown magic power emanating from the entire village. But where a normal person would see cause for suspicion, Percival only sees cause for excitement, and Donnie just wants a place to relax, so he and Percival run straight in, ignoring all the red flags. The old man who was watching them before comes down to warn them of the dangers of the village, admittedly too late as Percival and Dunny have already crossed the barrier. Sin chases after them since he can't leave them to fend for themselves in a dangerous village, but as Anna and Najin try to follow, the old man stops them and warns that if they cross that barrier, they won't be able to return. That is not a real village, instead is a monster den. Percival and Dunny make it up to the village, and even though they are this close to them, they still haven't once wondered why everyone there seems to not have eyes. They introduce themselves, and Dunny asks if there is a restaurant nearby that they can buy a drink at, so the elder of the village, and the only one with eyes comes out and tells them that there are only drinks that are homemade in this village, so he invites them in to have some. Out in the field, the old man introduces himself as Ard and his dog as Kelly, and he once again warns Anna to not go near that village. She asks what's up with the village and the creepy aura is giving off, so Ard begins to explain the nature of the village. It was once a normal village, but then ten years ago, those things just showed up and started living there without permission. Nations agrees that something definitely feels off about the village, from what he can see, they all look like regular humans. Ard yells at him not to be fooled by their appearance, since he has seen it personally. As soon as one of those things leaves the barrier, it will transform into a monster and every single traveler that has entered that village has never been seen or heard from again. He tells them once more to please not go into the village, but now knowing how dangerous it is, they can't just sit by and leave their friends to suffer the same fate as the unlucky travelers before them. They ask Ard to give them any information that might be useful in rescuing their friends from the village, but Ard is still worried for their safety. Meanwhile, in the village, Donnie and Percival are busy stuffing their faces full of the mysterious drink that the village chief gave them, and while Donnie keeps shoving away, he can't help but praise the chief for the unique flavor of the drink. The chief explains that the drink is something special that he makes personally in this village, and even though I'm sure he'll regret it later, Donnie seems to really like the drink. Percival somehow thinks the creepy smiles on the people's faces are meant to be welcoming, but Donnie finds it odd that they haven't said a single word this entire time, so the chief tries to play it off by saying they just don't speak the language of Britannia, so they are choosing to not speak at all. The two smooth brains buy the excuse and go back to talking with one another, while the village chief is suspiciously eyeing the coffin piece that Percival's sword is made out of. Sin comes up behind the old man and begins questioning him on his intentions. He knows they have been using that bird in the sky to spy on them, so he may be after Percival, or maybe the coffin fragment, or maybe even both. Percival and Dunny tell Sin that he is just overreacting and the people here are pretty nice, although a bit creepy. The chief hears Sin's name and becomes intrigued. Enough so that he requests to have a chat with Sin in private and he agrees to it, so he jumps down to go talk to the elder, while Percival and Dunny continue to stuff their faces. They even go as far as saying Nasians and Anna are missing out by not coming in here with them. They finish their plates of food and ask for a refill. But as one of the villagers goes to get another helping for them, he meets the butcher and begins to speak in the demon language. He is going to prepare another meal for them, but that bag that's wriggling all over the place looks really human-like. And as the demon butchers it with a smile on his face, I can only wonder what the hell Dunny and Percival just ate. Meanwhile, Sin has been incapacitated by the village elder who is surprised that he could figure out his true identity in such a short amount of time. Outside the village, Nasians, Anna, and Art are watching from behind a bush while Art explains what he knows about the village. The barrier around it is marked out by the series of stones that are laid out on the ground, and that is the point where if a villager crosses, it will revert back to their original demon form. The careless villager that left the barrier and reverted to demon form made the village chief mad, but Anna asks who this village chief is. Art explains that the village chief is the one who is at least 10 feet tall and actually has eyes, so it's pretty hard to miss him. But even with him there, it should be possible to lure the villagers out of the barrier and revert them to demons. Art has a plan and tells them that they'll be aiming for a rock located in the center of the village. It is oddly shaped and they seem to take care of it often. So they are likely to go into an uproar if that thing is destroyed, and that's when they'll sneak in to save the others. Nations wonders if they will really be okay to take such a huge risk, but Art assures them that he will draw the attention of the monsters so they can infiltrate the village undetected. Even if he says he will do that, that would only end up putting him in danger, so Nations wonders why he is willing to go so far to help them. Ard can understand why they find it strange since he did only just recently meet them, a truth be told, he once had a daughter who looked a lot like Anna. They lived happily for a while, but then he lost her when the village was taken over by the demons. That is why he took on the role of a guardian to warn travelers of the village. 
Anna remembers how her father treasured her more than anything in the world, so she can understand how Ard must feel after losing his daughter, and furthermore, she can tell that he isn't lying about anything thanks to her ability. She tells Majans that it is alright to trust him, so Majans thanks him for his help. They head down to the barrier, but once they reach it, Ard warns them that from here on out, he won't be able to join them. Anna and Najans are able to pass through without resistance, but when Ard tries, he receives a terrible shock. All he can do now is distract the demons, so he starts doing this. Anna and Najans sneak around the side while they head towards the center of the village, but then Najans spots Dunny, who seems to be in a great deal of pain. He runs up to try and help Dunny, but finds himself surrounded by the villagers there, and as Anna continues to the village center, she finds Percival fighting with one of the villagers. She knows that even if she tries, she probably wouldn't be able to help in any way, so she leaves him for now and goes to accomplish the goal of toppling the giant rock. She finds it and ties a rope to its base so she and Sylvan can pull it down. But it's not going to be an easy feat. Meanwhile, Nations has helped Dunny recover from the pain he got from overeating and runs over to check on Percival. But it seems that he was just having a friendly Suma fight with his villager, Dolchimon. Dunny asks how he managed to find out the guy's name. So Percival explains that Dolcio mentioned it while they were sparing. Although he said it in the demon language which none of them recognize, but Percival is able to speak it fluently for some reason. Anna and Sylvan finally begin to make some progress in their attempt to topple the stone, and eventually, it comes crashing to the ground. As the stone is destroyed, the barrier around the village is undone and the transformations of the demons are equally reversed. Outside the village, Art takes off his disguise and reveals that he is actually a holy knight and is here for the demons of the village. Inside the village, Anna runs around scared while looking for her friend, and when she finally finds them, they are all being held by Dolcio. She freaks out and tries to fight him, but Percival calls out to her and says it's okay, since they are actually friends. It looks like they fucked up on this one. The villagers were actually really nice, even if they may be demons, and the barrier was just put in place so they could look like regular humans and not scare the passing travelers. And now that they've destroyed it, they've not only undone their illusion, but they've also allowed the enemy to invade. The Holy Knight of King Arthur, Ardbeck. The two men recognize the voice of the Holy Knight to be the same as Ard's, but they don't understand why he is dressed like that now. So he makes it clear by declaring to them that he is a knight of King Arthur, and is here for one reason, and one reason only. Genocide. Anna is shocked to learn that Ard is one of King Arthur's knights, and even more so, when she learns that the demons here are part of the demon clan. The same one that plunged Britannia into chaos in the past. And yeah, when you say it like that, then it does sound like the demons are really bad, but the village elder states that all the demons here are the ones who actively refuse to participate in that war, so they are innocent. However, facts like that have no effect on Ard's stance, so he is going to get rid of them regardless of whether or not they committed any war crimes. He pulled an amber gem from his jacket, and as he cast a spell wig it in his hand, all the demons in the village begin to get sucked up and sealed away. The amber he is holding is the amber of the four archangels, so it is far more powerful than the regular goddess ambers that they've been using to seal demons and can hold dozens more within it. He notices Percival at his feet and actually believing that he is doing him a favor, tells him that he doesn't have to worry anymore because all the demons have been successfully sealed away, but after taking a closer look at Percival's his crazy haircut, he remembers the description he was given of one night of the apocalypse and Percival fits the bill insanely well. He also sees the coffin piece that was turned into a sword for Percival, and knowing what it is, he is sure that the kid in front of him right now is trouble. As soon as it clicked in Percival's smooth brain that Dolchimont was sealed inside that crystal by Ard, he gets up and readies himself for a fight. He yells at Ard for doing something like that to his friend, but Ard can't believe what he is hearing. A child is friends with a demon that is insane, and he immediately tries to deal with the situation the same way the 1500s church would have handled it and attempts to kill him. Ard says the prophecy was really right about Percival bringing destruction to the world since if he believes demons can actually be good people, then there's no telling what else he believes. For the sake of the perfect world that King Arthur is trying to build, Ard must kill Percival here and now so he can't stand in the way of their perfect plan. Anna tries to get Ard to stop what he is doing because Percival is a dear friend of theirs, but unfortunately, it isn't going to be that easy to resolve the dispute. Still. Ard is nicer than some of the other holy knights because he tells Anne and Nations that they should get away from here so they don't get hurt by the battle that is about to take place, but she isn't gonna back off on this one, because she owes Percival big time after he saved her from Ironside's rampage, so in their eyes, he's nothing less than a hero who carries the team to victory. Percival once again demands that Ard hand over the Amber and release the demons, but he has no intention of doing so. He calls for his dog, Sierra, who had become this huge monster when transformed. 
is a holy beast which is said to have come from purgatory itself, and purgatory must have served as one hell of a training ground because that thing used only one paw up backhand Percival halfway across the village. Percival ends up crashing into one of the buildings, but even with the distance between them, it isn't stopping yet as it begins charging up and fires a blast straight at Percival. However, it didn't manage to hit him as Percival got up and jumped out of the way before he could be killed. But while trying to escape, he jumped right into a trap as the monster appears right behind him and is about to chomp down. Luckily, Percival managed to get his bearings before that happens and flies out of the way to safety. From the ground, Nasians yells that Percival should take out the beast's horns first in order to stop its long-range attack, so he does exactly that. However, the horns on that thing's head were insanely hard, so not even the power of Percival's relentless swinging could damage it. After staying in the same place for too long, the monster finally activates its horns, shocks Percival badly. While all this is going on, Sylvan is running for cover because he ain't built for fighting, but in the building he decided to hide and he finds Sin lying on the floor unconscious and begins to panic because he believes Sin has been killed. However, his worries were unfounded as Sin slowly gets up from his nap. He has just been asleep this whole time, but as he exits the building, he sees that while he was out, things got out of hand really quick. Percival is being bounced around like a tennis ball by Ceri, and there is nothing he can do to fight back against it. Ceri is clearly just playing with its food, so R tells it to hurry up and just finish Percival off already. While he was distracted, Anes snuck up behind him and held him at sword point before asking how he managed to trick them, when she is able to detect all lies, but Ard never truly lied to her as every word he spoke was true in some way. He actually is a hunter, just a little different, because he hunts demons and he really did intend to help them save their friends from the demon village, but then one of their friends turned out to be a destruction bringer, so stuff happens and now he's going to kill Percival. The villager chief points out that his actions couldn't have been solely for the sake of the kids because he used them to get in here. The barrier had the effect of keeping the demons looking like regular-ish people, but it also had the bonus of repelling any and every person that attempts to enter the village with hostility or, in Ard's case, murderous intent. Ard admits that he may have slightly used the children to get into the village, but he doesn't see the problem with what he did. He couldn't get in, so modern problems require modern solutions. He counters Ane and proceeds to block all the blows she has thrown at him, so she starts telling him to give up the amber so she can release the demons. They have done nothing to deserve this kind of treatment, so she doesn't understand why he hates them so much. He tells her she is the one who is wrong here because back in his day, they went through hell because of the demons. Villages were destroyed, homes ruined, and families, including his own, were killed. So just like Friaran, he will never let a demon walk freely as long as he lives. The prophecy surrounding Percival means he will lead to a catastrophe far greater than the one that was caused by the demons, so he is doing the right thing by trying to kill him. Percival gets knocked away by Ceri again and lands next to the refreshed Sin who asks what he is doing out there. He got a whole new sword and everything, but he is still out here getting his ass whooped by a dog. Percival explains that the dog's antlers are super tough, so he isn't able to just cut through them with the dragon's sword or his magic sword. Sin asks why he is using them separately, and Percival realizes he has been nerfing himself this entire time. He immediately combines the two swords, and we all get to see the new Percival meta in its full glory. As the dog charges at him again, Percival is able to slash off one of its horns in one go when he couldn't even scratch them before. Sin explains that when weapons are enchanted by magic, it isn't just a regular addition of power. Their power is usually multiplied by two or three times, but in the case of Percival's power, it multiplies its strength by over ten times. And that boost allows Percival to easily cut off the second horn of the beast without so much as a scratch. Percival gets hyped over his new power-up and starts emoting in the sky, but the others warn him not to let his guard down while the fight is still going on. However, it is too late, and gets chomped down by the beast, before he can react. This would normally be a fatality for any of the others, but for Percival, he managed to keep the beast's teeth off him, buying the others enough time for Nasians to use his poison magic and put the beast to sleep. Thanks to that, Percival was saved, and all that was left to do was deal with Ard. However, Ard has already started running away because he knows he's about to get his ass jumped. They could probably just forget about him and move on, but he still has the amber with all the demon villagers sealed away inside it, so they have to find him. The village chief assumes that Ard would probably head for the Crystal Grotto, which is a cavern near the village. He probably set up camp there so he could be near the village for a moment like this. Now, knowing where to go, Percival is ready to go save the demons, but before he does, the village chief asks him why he is so willing to help the demons even though they are from a clan that caused great suffering to the humans, but Percival doesn't really see it that way. For one, he never saw this war happen, even with what happened, just because there are some bad demons doesn't mean they all deserve to be killed. 
In his case, just because his father killed his grandfather, it's not like he is going to go on a quest to kill all fathers in the world because of it. And even though he has come across bad holy knights, there are still good ones out there like Hauser, so if he hasn't given up on becoming one yet. They arrive at the Crystal Grotto, and this place is practically screaming, I'm a trap, but they go in anyway without worrying about it. As they walk further in, Dunny is acting really confident about being Ard, like he has forgotten that he is the weakest one in the team. But then again, he might actually have a point since Ard was the weakest holy knight they've seen so far. Plus something that they probably should have thought of earlier is the fact that they never actually saw him use his magic power back there. Ard's voice echoes through the cave as he points out they are right. His magic isn't suited for upfront fights, so he needed to lure them into a place like this. Otherwise, he would have lost easily. His magic takes some time to activate, but before long, they all suddenly start shrinking a lot. Though Percival was already pretty short, so there wasn't much height lost there. This is Ard's magic. He is able to turn all living things within a certain range into babies, and once they are transformed, there is no way he can lose. He has already started that he isn't scared to pun infant if it is for world peace, however, as he grabs Percival and is about to punt him, maybe Anna starts crying behind him. Anna looks exactly like his daughter who died in the war, so Ard has a flashback to the war and how his baby girl died. Morality is making it really hard to punt Percival now, but he tells himself that he has no choice but to do it. However, before he gets in punting position, the village chief shows up and tells him that he doesn't have the heart to kill babies. This was the end of episode 13. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.